Let's uh, call to order the November meeting of the Lawrence Douglas County Metropolitan Planning Commission. Um, we have a pretty heavy agenda tonight, lots of items that we'll be moving through, but before we do that, we want to welcome everyone who's here uh, to help us consider these items. Um, if you haven't been to a planning commission meeting before, the way this usually works is we will take care of some housekeeping matters up here first. Um, then we'll get into our agenda. <clears throat> For each item, we'll have a presentation from staff um, with their recommendation and overview. Uh, then we'll hear from an applicant if they're present or a representative of the applicant. And then um, we'll have time for public comment. During that public comment period, we'd ask that you come up to the uh, podium, speak into the microphone. There should be a list up there that you can sign with your name. Let us know your name. Um, and then what we do, because we have to make a good record and we have to make sure everybody has an equal opportunity to be heard, is uh, if you're an individual, you get three minutes. And we have a handy clock over here that Scott McCullough, our planning director, usually operates. If you represent a neighborhood association or some other kind of organization, then you get five minutes to speak on behalf of that organization. And uh, keep an eye on your time. I'll try and warn you when you get right up to it. But we do ask that you uh, respect those time limits because that's how we keep this fair for everybody. So um, as we go through this, uh, after we get through the public hearing part or portion, the um, applicant will have an opportunity to respond to any of the concerns that have been raised. And then after that, we'll bring it up here and we'll discuss. We may ask questions of staff or the applicant, um, things like that. If we happen to ask a question of a member of the public, please answer just the question that we ask um, and come up to the microphone when you do it. We don't do that often, but when we do, we need to make sure that answers are limited to the questions we ask. So. Without further ado, we'll get into our um, housekeeping portion of the agenda here. Um, do we have, Scott, any um, new written communications that weren't in our packet update today? Everything's there. Um, any additional communications from staff, other commissioners? Any written action of uh, waiver requests or determinations by the city engineer? Um, now we'll disclose ex parte communications for members of the public. These are uh, communications that a planning commissioner may have had with somebody else outside this meeting that would pertain to a public hearing item on our uh, agenda tonight. So if anybody has had any such communications, they'll disclose it now and let us know the substance of that communication. Any ex parte to report? All right, seeing none. Uh, Next, declarations of abstentions. Any commissioners abstaining from agenda items tonight? Uh, Vice Chairman Kelly? I'm going to abstain from item number seven. And that's... Uh, okay. Commissioners, as you, as you make this declaration, maybe good to explain a little yes, bit. Yes, sorry. <laughs> getting settled in. Sorry, I'm late. Um, yeah, my employer is uh, uh, at the College and Career Center, which is the neighbor of the applicant's property and i am the director of that center there thank you commissioner culver yeah i'll also be abstaining from item number seven I currently serve on the board of directors for boys and girls club and they are planning to build a teen center facility immediately adjacent to the college and career center so uh, just to be to make sure that, that there's not an appearance or um, perception that I was unable to be impartial, I'll be abstaining. Okay. Thank you both. Any other abstentions tonight? Okay, well then, let's move into our regular agenda. Item number one. Minutes. Oh, the minutes. Yeah, yeah I'm getting confused. I I skipped over committee reports as well. I got so excited. Um, we have uh, draft minutes from our October meeting in our packet. We've had the opportunity to review them. Did anybody see any revisions that were necessary? Or if not, it entertain a motion to approve the minutes? Moved from Commissioner Struckoff. Second. Seconded from Vice Chairman Kelly. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving the minutes, raise your hand. Unanimously approved. 
Um, committee reports. Any committee reports <coughs> from commissioners? Yeah, Commissioner Culver. Yeah, last week we had the ORIAD Design Guidelines Subcommittee met and we reviewed the draft version of the guidelines and with a couple of small changes, those will be finished up and then I believe they will go to the neighborhoods and to the public for um, some feedback and then we'll be coming to the Planning Commission, or um, I would say within the first quarter of next year. Sounds good. Yeah, and I think our miscellaneous item two, we'll talk a little bit about the, those two. Um, any other committee reports, updates? Okay. Now I'm so excited, let's do item number one. This is a application for a variance at 1714 West 23rd Street. The aerial on the overhead represents the property of the subject of this application. Staff has received applications for redevelopment of the property that includes site plan and a minor subdivision. Both of those items are typically administrative except for the minor subdivision. Um, when it has a variance from the subdivision regulations, it comes to this body um, for a variance. And this particular variance is something this commission has seen relatively recently and it has to do with the fact that the right of way for West 23rd Street, which is a principal arterial street, a new principal arterial streets are typically 150 feet wide. West 23rd Street in this segment is about 100 feet wide and to expand that additional right of way by another 25 feet on this side would really limit any redevelopment opportunities uh, for this property. So this is one of those interior existing urban uh, streets that we have been supportive of variances for um, these types of uh, redevelopment requests. So that's the project. The minor subdivision, you should have a copy of it in your packet. Um, highlights where that uh, new lot is. There'll be a number of uh, cross access easements, some shared parking, as well as um, a new building. Okay, thank you very much. Is the applicant present? I'm not sure they were planning to be. Okay. Well, this is a public hearing item. Any Members from the public here to speak on this item? None? Going once, going twice. We'll close the public hearing, bring it back up to the commission for discussion or questions. Yes, Commissioner Denny. Quick question. This, uh, what we did the number of curb cuts in the area? Four to three, is that, do my reading this right? Ultimately, that's part of the project, yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> Other questions? Discussion, Commissioner Lee. Uh, what, what we, <laughs> we don't send it to City Council, do we? No. Right. No, we so just we approve it up here, right? There it's my motion to approve it. And the I'll second whatever his motion was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm sure Denny has it perfectly. Um, <laughs> we have a motion to approve the variance. We have a second from Commissioner Denny. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your hands. Unanimously approved. Thank you. These are so much faster than that. Item number two, a variance at 2540 Iowa Street. Good evening, Becky Pepper with the Planning Department. This is gonna be very similar to the item that Sandy just brought before you. This is also for a, a variance request and a reduction of right of way width. Uh, this is for a subject property that is located east of um, Iowa Street, south of 25th Street at 2540 Iowa Street. Uh, Iowa Street is classified as a principal arterial, which according to the land development code re would require 150 feet of right of way, but it was uh, developed prior to this, the adoption of this standard, so it, it is approximately 100 feet in width. The city engineers indicated that um, there are no plans to, uh, for additional uh, width that are needed. Um, what we have is adequate. And therefore, staff recommends approval of the variance request to allow the right of way width for Iowa to remain at 100 feet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. 
Is the applicant present? Okay. Any members of the public wish to speak on this item? Nobody? Okay. We'll close the public hearing, bring it back up for discussion or motions. Commissioner Lease. I move to approve this one. We have a motion to approve the variance as set out in the staff memo. Second. Seconded by Commissioner Sands. Any discussion, questions for staff? Seeing none, all those in favor of the variance and the motion, raise your hand. Unanimously approved. All right. Well, we are rolling so far. <laughs> Item three. This is a rezoning of 1501, and I always pronounce this the wrong way. There's two ways to pronounce it, and I'll pronounce it the wrong way. Lernard Avenue. Does everyone's item number three say item number one? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yep. Thank you. I assume that's a holdover from last month when we saw this. Um, <coughs> this was deferred from our October meeting for consideration and hopefully a recommendation one way or another tonight. Thank you, Commissioners. This is Sheila Stogsdill standing in for Mary Miller. Um, and as you can see, uh, the presentation is generally from last month's meeting. You heard this last month and deferred the item. Um, this is at the southwest corner. Um, this shows the existing site of 15th and Lenard, and then shows the proposal that would include two new buildings here and some additional um, greenhouses eventually um, if the zoning is approved. Uh, Mary had gone through what the proposed uses were last month and what with changing it to IL additional uses would be possible. Um, many of those uses are actually allowed in the RS zoning district that it's in today. Um, but it does allow the limited um, industrial uses that are requested. Um, the additional meeting that um, the neighborhood had, Mary provided you with a summary memo from that. Um, they met just last <coughs> week. And basically, there were a number of options that were discussed and um, staff has recommended the option that would um, have the zoning have a special condition on it that would be that all site plans would go to the city commission for approval to provide that additional public um, input for the area. Uh, and with that, we are happy to um, move on to the public hearing and listen to your direction. Thank you very much, Sheila. Uh, is the applicant present to, and do you have any, any words for us? Do you want to speak or should we move on to the public hearing? I would like for you to vote. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll uh, by the way that you're nodding, you're, you're saying see my previous comments at last month's meeting and vote to approve. Um, <coughs> the, minute, the minutes will reflect that. Um, any members of the public wish to speak on this item? We had a healthy contribution from the public at last month's meeting and we're happy to have more. And again, sign in, tell us your name, and you'll have three minutes which will be Marked by the clock. My name's Jim Carpenter. Um, live in the Barker neighborhood. There's not been a meeting to talk about what we discussed last week to have a neighborhood consensus, so I'm here speaking as an individual this evening. I want to thank Mr. Milstein for meeting with us. We're attempting to find some resolution to this. This project is made especially difficult because of the fine intentions of all the people that want to make use of this property. From the Sunrise Project, all the different groups, Mr. Milstein, he <coughs> really has a passion for that greenhouse, wants to preserve it somehow. 
The only reason we're actually here tonight is because of the request to move central soy food there and also to put in a second building for another limited manufacturing use, which would require changing RS7 to IL zoning in the middle of the neighborhood. This, uh, this zoning, <laughs> this plot of land is surrounded by RS7 and RS5. The staff report makes some logical leaps that I would question. One of those is that this has been a greenhouse since 1921, according to the KDAG report, which has been out there to look at environmental camp contamination and by the city report since 1928. But whatever it is, that greenhouse was first built outside the city limits. It was built up around it with residential zoning. <clears throat> when it first came into the city um, with the zoning plans that first went into effect in the 60s, this was determined not to be an appropriate use for the surrounding zoning of, of what, whatever the category at that time was for residential property. So what they did is it was a non-conforming use. It's been a non-conforming use until December of 2013 when Sunrise Nursery shut down and then all their equipment was sold off in July of 2014. So it sat, the non-conforming use is gone, it's reverted to RS7. What's being asked today is to reward the fact that we have an old building here that managed to survive for all those years as a non-conforming use. And the staff report says that we're supposed to be looking at the historic character of the building, want to preserve a historic building, yet, as you see from staff report, this won't qualify as a historic property. It's just an old building, essentially, when you separate all the people out and all the, the good idea intentions for it. So what we're asking for is a plot of industrial zoning in the middle of a neighborhood. Now what I'm asking is that, sit, that the commission come up with a way to preserve the RS7. One thing that was suggested was combine this with the urban ag, add an overlay district, you keep got it about RS. 10 seconds, Mr. Carr. I understand. So add, add an overlay district that would permit all these uses by special use permit. We're only talking about two potential uses that require this change and no control over what comes into the future other than limited to talking about lighting and aesthetic reasons. So I'd ask you to deny the zoning request tonight. Thank you very much. Other public comment? Hello, uh, my name is Matthew Stevens, and I live like three houses down from the site. And I just wanted to remind, I think last month, um, it was stated that for the greenhouse structure itself to remain, that it would have the only class that exists right now is the limited industrial. And as a member of the immediate surrounding neighborhood of the greenhouse, um, I would like to see it stay there even whether it can be registered historic or not, I think it's an important part of the neighborhood and of that immediate area. And I think the meeting that they had and they came up with this memo to basically have any changes go before the city commission, I think that gives the neighborhood plenty of opportunity to speak their minds if any site changes come about from what you're gonna vote on tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? Hi, my name is Melissa Freiberger. I'm with Sunrise Project. I also live in the neighborhood. I live three doors down from the property, and I just wanted to remind the uh, commission that there were several letters of support sent by neighbors, several of whom their uh, property actually abuts this property, and they are supportive of changing the zoning. 
for all the reasons, uh, for all the reasons of why we want to use the property. And I just want to emphasize that being very rooted in the neighborhood, my child goes to Cordley um, Elementary School and I have a child at LHS. There's one or two people, one who's spoken here, that are opposed to this, but overwhelming support. And a lot of these are families that can't make it tonight. So I'm just wanting to be that voice of support and remind you of those letters. And again, several of those letters are of people whose property actually abuts um, Sunrise. So um, I'm in favor of it, obviously, but I also just want to let you know that, um, just remind you of the support that's also there from others in the neighborhood. Thank you. Other public comments? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll close the public hearing. Uh, the applicant, if you wish to respond or address any of the concerns that have been raised, you can come to the podium and do that if you care to. Uh, during the meeting that we had with uh, the representatives that were uh, against this uh, rezoning, I asked them the question of who they, who they represented. Who are the, uh, are they representing the neighborhood or are they just representing their own, uh, their own opinions? <laughs> and really when it came down to it, my interpretation of it was they were representing their own opinions without very much input from the neighborhood in general. And when you look at it that way, I think it's more obstruction to the project from two or three individuals than it is from the neighborhood. I close my remarks. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. We'll bring it back up to the commission for discussion, questions, motions. Commissioner Lease. Uh, knowing that we can have discussion uh, up here after a motion, and having heard this last, I believe I was the one who said we should uh, defer it. And what I was hoping for has occurred, and I'm quite satisfied with the outcome, including the letters we've written, so I appreciate the recommendation to read them, although I've read them and I agree with the statement uh, a few minutes ago. So I'm gonna move, um, to recommend approval of this rezoning request for approximately 2.96 acres from RS7 um, district to IL district with use restrictions um, and forwarding it to the city commission with a recommendation for approval based on the findings of fact found in the body of the staff report. The conditions stated uh, are 1A through N. So that's my motion. And I, just a question, Commissioner Lease. I think that the additional condition regarding sending site plans to the city yeah. commission for Thanks. approval, I don't think that's listed there. Thank you. Is, that's part of your motion? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. Part of my motion. And <coughs> the 3,000 square feet is already. Is the 3,000 square feet in there for administrative yes, and professional eight. office? Uh, okay. It's F. Well, it doesn't limit it to 3,000 square feet, does it, or am I missing something? No, not that use. Okay. So do we need to, do you intend to include that portion of the recommendation? Yeah, absolutely. The first bullet yes, point? Yes, administrative and professional offices, you mean? Limited to no more than 3,000 gross right. square feet. Okay. Okay, we have a motion to approve with the uh, um, restrictions listed in the staff report in addition to the two restrictions in the recommendation of staff for site plan approval by the city commission and administra administrative and professional offices limited to 3,000 gross square feet. Do we have a second? You have it, I think you second. Commissioner Kelly seconds. <coughs> Discussion on the motion. Yep, Commissioner Von Aachen. Sheila, I know we went over this last month, but could you refresh my mind why P overlay does not, is not applicable here? Um, it is also an option. Um, it would be an option that would um, set the project 
back because in order to zone to a PD overlay, you would need to have the actual plan um, already prepared and before you a uh, plan development, um, preliminary development plan. And so in <coughs> staff's um, opinion, the site plan approval to the city commission gives you that same element of control and public um, input. It just takes the planning commission out of the actual review of that site plan. Thank you. And I think too the issue is that not there's kind of a menu of uses that the applicant wants available and doesn't have them locked down enough to put them on a rock solid site plan at this time. So the equivalency, as Sheila said, is this condition of site plan go to the city commission. Okay. I'll say that this is, um, I'll vote in favor of the motion. I think that the deferral for a month helped. Um, this is a unique piece of property with a unique history and it, we've sort of taken a unique approach to it. I think the site planning requirement through the city commission will really give that kind of control to the neighborhood to speak up when the time comes if something's not shaken out the way that you like it um, that process is there and I, I take a lot of confidence from that that what ends up being used out there or how it ends up being used will be agreeable to the neighbors Commissioner Denny and and indeed everybody involved in this want to maintain the character of this area uh, and what's what's wanting to be done here I think we'll do that uh, the concerns that, that I hit on the strongest was uh, the mention of factories uh, here and uh, manufacturing distribution turning into some sort of serious industrial area. But I want to note that in the motion uh, and the approval uh, says that limited manufacturing and production will have to be approved by a special use permit. In addition, light wholesale storage and distribution will have to be approved by a special use permit. So I think that puts sufficient controls on this being a slippery slope into a serious industrial area and for those reasons I'll be uh, supporting this motion. Excellent comments. Commissioner Denny, any others? Any other questions? Vice Chair Kelly. I'll just weigh in on the urban agriculture part of it. At our last meeting we had a chance to start working through that um, rezoning or new zoning and in my mind, it doesn't quite fit what we're talking about here. Um, you know, we were talking about places where you could, on a limited scale, uh, have some farming um, on your property. This is much larger than that in my mind and doesn't quite connect. So um, I appreciate the time to go through that and go through that with the public, but um, I don't think it applies here. And so I'll vote in favor of the recommendation. <clears throat> Any other comments? All right, seeing none, we have a motion and a second. The motion is to approve with the recommendation, uh, recommend approval with the restrictions listed. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Unanimously approved. <coughs> okay. Thank you, uh, neighbors, members of the public, for showing up at a second meeting for that. We'd like to get it all done in one meeting, but sometimes it helps to take a little extra time and I think this is one of those occasions so we will move on to item 4 rezoning 5800 Overland Drive rezoning request uh, to uh, rezone from RM12D to RS7 and OS at 5800 Overland Drive. The subject property is located in the northwest area of town. Um, specifically, it's east of George William Way and north of Overland Drive. As you can see from this slide here, there are a variety of uh, zoning districts that surround the subject property. There is multifamily zoning to the north and the south. There is single family zoning to the east and there's commercial zoning to the west. 
<coughs> the area is being developed with a variety of uses. Um, the subject property is located to the southeast of the Rock Chalk Park. Um, in addition, there is multifamily and single family developments occurring to the north, south, and east. The commercial development to the west uh, is currently undeveloped, but it is uh, part of the Mercado development, which has received preliminary approval. Now, the purpose of the rezoning is to accommodate single family development, um, which is stemming from a change in the housing market and with the uh, the development of the Rock Chalk Park in the area. Uh, also, a minor <coughs> subdivision has been submitted by the applicant, which staff is reviewing. Um, with this minor subdivision, they're proposing reducing the density from uh, 37 duplex lots to 51 <coughs> single family lots. Um, what you can also see here on the slide, there is a small portion of land that is proposed to be rezoned from uh, RM20, RM12D to OS. Um, this is a, a city easement that is attached to that green area to the east. Um, so with this rezoning request, we would be um, aligning that easement to the adjacent uh, green space and so the uh, zoning would be consistent. So all of the golden factors were reviewed with this re uh, rezoning request and you can find those in the staff report. Um, listed here are some of the uh, re review criteria that were uh, used when reviewing the rezoning request. The rezoning does conform with the comprehensive plan and the Northwest uh, plan. Um, Horizon 2020 states that residential development should include a mixture of housing types and that the emphasis should be on single, uh, single family development. And so this rezoning uh, request with this, the surrounding existing zonings uh, does not contradict that plan. Uh, also, the de this proposed development plan aligns with the Northwest plan, uh, which encourages single family development in the area where the subject property is located, and then uh, encourages multi family development further south of the area um, closer to 6th Street. Um, the compatibi compatibility of the uh, uh, rezoning request is also enforced by the zoning and land use uh, surrounding the, sub the subject property. Uh, as stated before, the areas to the north and the south are already zoned multifamily development, um, but the area to the east is zoned RS7, a single dwelling uh, development, zoning development district. And uh, so this rezoning request would align with that adjacent zoning district. The property was originally zoned multifamily in 2004, uh, 2004 but it has been uh, vacant since that time. Um, with the changes to the housing market and with the development of the Rock Chalk Park, the applicant now uh, desires to develop the land as a single family development. Um, however, the, the uh, current multifamily RM12D zoning uh, does not, is not suitable for that uh, proposed development. Um, under the current multifamily zoning, detached dwellings are permitted, but with the approval of a special use permit. And given the level of development for this uh, uh, project here, that would be an onerous uh, request. So given that staff recommends approval of the rezoning request for approximately 11.8 acres from RM12D district to RS7 district, and approximately 0 0.055 acres from RM12 to OS district, and forwarding to the city commission with a recommendation for approval based on the findings of fact in the body of the staff report. Thank you. Thank you. Is the applicant present? Wish to speak? Come on up. I'm John McGrew and uh, one of the members of Oregon Trail Holdings. I think it's been explained very well. Um, I've seen a number of cycles in Lawrence market in my lifetime and five years ago we had way too many single family lots today we don't have enough it's really kind of as simple as that that the townhomes that we build out there are moving along but the single family is moving much faster and the single family we have on the east side of the trail in the pond is fast selling out so we're just trying to anticipate the market serve the market and provide more single family lots when they're needed Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. Any members of the public wish to speak on this item? None? Okay, seeing none, we'll close the public hearing.
Bring it back up to the commission for discussion. Commissioner Lease. Similar to my last three motions, I'm gonna make another one because there's no opposition to this and it makes perfect sense and we probably shouldn't waste our time. Everyone's in agreement. So I move to recommend approval of the request to rezone approximately 11.8 acres from RM12D district to RS7 district and 0.055 acres from RM12D to OS open space district based on the findings of fact presented in the staff report forwarding it to the city commission with a recommendation for approval. We have the motion. Do we have a second? Yes. Second from Commissioner Struckoff. Any discussion on the motion? Questions for staff? Seeing none. All those in favor, raise your hand. Passes unanimously. Wow, Bruce. <coughs> on a roll for real. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Item five. Conditional use permit for East 1300 Road and North 650 Road. The Public Wholesale Water Supply District number 25. Evening again. Uh, this too is an item that was Mary's, um, so I will do my best to um, present this information to you. Uh, basically, you have a CUP request um, that is in support of a water treatment plant for a new rural water district that was. Um, was created and the treatment plant was approved uh, by this commission about a year ago and that approval has been uh, extended so this booster station and standpipe um, are part of the ultimate infrastructure needed for um, providing that water supply uh, this slide shows the general location of the property and um, so it's on the south side of N, I'm sorry, um, N 1500 Road and on the east side of E 1750 Road. Um, this gives you a little bit of um, the surrounding land uses. There's um, quite a bit of agricultural area and some rural residential um, residences. Uh, you have in your packet a letter that's signed by four property owners that was received this morning. And um, I've shown you this yellow asterisk area shows the site of the improvements and the four homeowners properties are shown here, three along. Um, e1750 Road and then um, the last one farther to the north along the east side of that road. Uh, there are two improvements that will be um, constructed, the 85 foot tall standpipe and then a small booster station um, pump house and Mary has provided some pictures of similar improvements um, throughout the county. Um, the site plan that you have in your packet um, shows the three acres that the water district has an option on and shows where the booster um, pump building will be located and then where the standpipe will be located. Um, the fenced area is 150 feet south of um, what would be the north property line and um, about 50 feet to the east. So the site plan does include landscaping along this um, part of E1750 
1300 road. I had the roads very, very mis <laughs> misidentified. Um, and 650 road and E1300, excuse me. Um, not sure, oh, 1750 and, and 1500 is where the treatment plant was. So now that we have a real desire for Mary to be back, um, <laughs> you have a recommendation to forward this to the city, or to the county commission um, with a recommendation for approval. Um, and we've included the condition that it be administratively reviewed every five years, which is a fairly standard condition on most conditional <coughs> use permits. Happy to answer any questions that I might be able to on this. All right, thank you, Sheila. Is the applicant present? If you wish to address us, come on up to the podium. Hi, uh, thank you, commissioners. My name is uh, John Ruckman with Bartlett & West, speaking on behalf of Wholesale 25. Uh, as Sheila said, um, this is much like a lot of the other water storage tank booster pumping facilities that we have across the county. Uh, it is part of a larger project, as she mentioned, a treatment plant up along the Kansas River that'll take water essentially through Douglas County, serving customers throughout Douglas County, and then some into Osage County, getting as far as Overbrook. Uh, this is kind of the center point of the facilities. Essentially, it's where the water is pumped from the treatment facility. It comes to this tank and then is repumped again so that we can get it onto the, the far west, west extremes of the system for the wholesale district. There are only two customers to the wholesale district currently Douglas Number no. 5, which is a rural water district here in the county, and Osage Number no. 5, which is a rural water district in Osage County. Um, those districts serve approximately 2,500 customers, so this would be a supply for those those uh, residences across the counties. So, okay, thank you very much. Are there members of the public wish to speak on this item? Seeing no members of the public wishing to speak on this item, we will close the public hearing. Bring it back up to the commission for discussion and Commissioner Lee's thoughts. Uh, I, I You're move, on a roll. It's I move to uh, recommend approval to the conditional use permit for this standpipe and booster station. The utility use and forwarding it to the Board of County Commissioners with a recommendation for approval based on the findings of fact in the body of the staff report. Subject to the condition that it will be reviewed every five years. We have a second, or a motion, do we have a second? Commissioner Sands, seconds. Um, I have a quick question for staff, just, or maybe the applicant, whoever knows, how many of these are there throughout the county? Towers, water tanks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I couldn't tell you for sure. Yeah, come on up. I, <coughs> I would say that there's probably between 15 to 20, probably scattered across Douglas County anyways and probably that much as you get into Osage as well. Thanks. <clears throat> yep, Vice Chair Kelly. Another question for the applicant. Sorry to make you jump up and down there. So one of the letters we had from the public was that stated that the facility would be best suited in a less noticeable and intrusive location. Can you talk briefly about why you selected this location? Certainly. Um, as I mentioned, the, the location within our project for a midpoint is fairly important. It breaks up the amount of pressure that we put into pipes. We try to have a break at some point so we don't have to overpressurize early parts of the piping. We're also looking for areas. Our desire always is to build these as short as possible. Um, we look for higher elevation areas to put these on so that we can shorten up the tank height. Part of it is from a financial standpoint issue for the client. Uh, the other part is really to keep the tanks as short as we can. We looked early on at a location near here that would have required about a 175 foot tower. Uh, we realized that that probably in the client's interest and the others within the uh, community's interest wasn't the best thing. We sought out this location, a little higher elevation allowed us to shorten the tank up significantly, but it is generally uh, from a pumping pressure and an elevation standpoint. Thank you. 
Commissioner Lease. One of the reasons I was comfortable making this motion is that uh, when I was on City Council in LeCompton, we went through this entire process of building exactly what they are talking about, and it does require the height, and it um, requires a lot of engineering, a lot of good planning, so uh, that's why I support it. Commissioner Von Aachen. Um, that's good. Um, back to the letter. Yes. Of these four homeowners, can you um, address how close this tower would be to the closest of those homes? Yeah. And then they and also address the fact that <clears throat> they talk about the increased traffic noise. Ab yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think um, looking at the closest home, we're right at a thousand feet to that closest home, I think to the north. I think the other ones farther on to the north fall well beyond the thousand feet. Okay, help me visualize a thousand feet. Uh, three football fields. Okay, thank you. Okay, you may. I'm just going to put that net back up. Right. <coughs> Sheila just mentioned less than a quarter mile um, to the north. Um, as far as traffic and noise, this facility, uh, the pumps that will be running inside the building, the building will be insulated. You won't hear them. I mean, unless you're right up at the door, it's not going to have noise. Uh, the only other noise generation that we <coughs> could have would be this will have an on site generator to be used only in a power outage. Mm -hmm. um, the decibels that those operate at now, though, that uh, they would be less than the traffic noise along 650 roads. So, uh, and it, again, only running during emergency situations. Traffic at this location, uh, the, the wholesale district maximum would have somebody out here probably once a day in a pickup truck. Basically, they're gonna come out, they're gonna look at uh, how many hours the pumps have run the previous day, uh, try to collect some general information that's going to be there, but uh, there will not be traffic. People aren't going to be pulling in here with water tankers, taking water out of the system and those types of things. Uh, it is simply a facility that's meant to be unmanned uh, uh, other than, you know, 15 minutes a day when somebody stops by to make sure that something hasn't gone wrong. So, Thank you. Yeah. Commissioner Denny? Yeah, excuse me. Sheila, could you, using the picture that's up there, pointer and show me where this is at. I'm having trouble visualizing exactly where this is at. Um, let me... Oh, that does... Okay. Yeah, but I'm trying to so determine if it's on the other side of this wooded area or not. That's okay, so I'm this at. is um, the new interchange for 650. Yeah, I'm talking about in relation from that picture that was up oh. there. I'm trying to get an idea of the relationship oh. between these houses and where this is going to be. The okay. yellow star. Is it up by it, the stars where the yes. 718 is? Yes. No. Or is it on the other side of that driveway? Down, no, it's, down below. it's in this area here. Oh, down there. Okay, I'm mm -hmm. completely there. off. Okay. Yeah. These Thank are you. the these are the houses, the properties that um, the letters came from. Right. <coughs> I was having trouble visualizing. Yep. Thank you. Sorry. Other questions or comments? I will say that um, I, I think the applicant and staff have done a good job of laying out sort of how the already minimal impacts to the area will be minimized through the design of this, keeping it short. Um, you know, I, I live in the city and we've got all kinds of towers of all kinds around all the time. and. So you tend not to notice those things, but I understand that when you live out in a more rural area, these things take on a, a different nature when they show up down the street from you or something. So certainly understand the concern of the neighbors there, but this is the kind of public infrastructure and sort of public resource management stuff that we have to do. It's got to go somewhere, and, and I think staff and the applicant have done a good job of selecting this spot. Any other discussion, questions? All right, seeing none, all those in favor of Bruce's motion, raise your hand.
unanimously approved. Bruce May set a record tonight. We'll see. I probably I did. I probably did. Well, you know, you know why you have to go like hey, that? the Royals talked about winning a World Series all year, and then they won it. So well, I don't think Bruce will be disturbed by me mentioning the fact that, that. But the reward of getting this much done is we get to talk about parking, right? That's true, yeah. We will be here until midnight regardless. It's just a, ma a matter of how much of that is discussing the parking amendments. Uh, <coughs> thank you, Sheila. Um, item 6A and 6B relate to 5200 and 5300 Clinton Parkway. We have a rezoning as item 6A and then a special use permit for item 6B. Go for it. And with your indulgence, I'll do these two presentations kind of back to back with the rezoning. Um, the first piece of the rezoning is uh, moving this property uh, into a situation where it has all one zoning. Property is located on the north side of Clinton Parkway. It's adjacent to um, Yankee Tank Lake or Lake Albemarle. I think it has a number of different names. Um, there are also a number of existing improvements on this property today. The property includes three different zoning. Um, there is a public street there, it's called um, Olympic, and that is located right here kind of on um, that zoning boundary line. Property to the west is zoned RS40. That was a zoning that transitioned when we adopted the code in 2006. Prior to that, it was one of those um, RS1 zonings that when it came into the city, when it was annexed into the city, that was the zoning district that we would have applied to that property. It was known as Sport to Sport at that time. Um, and uh, I believe the tennis facility was known at one point in time as um, First Serve Tennis. This property originally um, just stopped right along this red line here, this zoning district line. When they did some improvements a number of years ago, they needed to acquire some ground. The property was replatted. Um, and that's where that GPI zoning comes from, was from this addition um, a number of years ago. So this property on the east side of Olympic Drive has GPI zoning and RM12 zoning request would bring it all the way into one um, consistent district. We've got some surrounding properties. The lake area has uh, been annexed into the city limits, but it has not been rezoned to a city designation at this time. Um, the property that's located in this quadrant is not in the city limits. It has quite a bit of right-of-way associated with K-10 and with Clinton Parkway. Um, there are a number of residential uses in this area as well as the Clinton Lake Softball Complex or YSI uh, located on the eastern side of that dividing line. This slide highlights the existing improvements that we're talking about. This is related to a special use permit. That's the uh, item B where they are proposing to do some interior modification to the building. It doesn't alter the footprint. Um, but we do have a change of use because it's moving from KU facility um, to a, a private facility. It's an active recreation use. Active recreation uses are allowed in the RM12 district subject to a special use permit. So that's how these two applications work together. Just a quick summary of uh, this is just orientation Olympic Drive here. Those proposed improvements really all stay on the east side of Olympic Drive. When the lake and the dam were reworked, um, this area became an overflow um, spillway for the lake. So development on this side of the property is not recommended. There are some conditions with the special use permit that really limit the ability to have any development of this space in the future. We did hear from an organization, I think there's a reference in your staff report, um, the group that manages this lake, they do not want to see development on this west side of Olympic Drive. They're okay, they're comfortable with the parking lot, but future building, recreation fields, those kinds of things, they would not be supportive of. That would be a process that would have to come back through the city, our city engineer, uh, stormwater engineer would also be engaged in a review of any kind of future development request 
on the west side of Olympic Drive. It's a quick summary of where those zoning district boundaries fall. That active recreation is a use that is allowed in the RM12 district and that's really the purpose of this rezoning. Staff's recommendation was for approval of the request. There were no conditions associated with that rezoning request. So you can see from this slide where the floodplain is, that emergency spillway would wrap around and come out through this property. Would also potentially inundate a, um, the parking lot if that were a significant event. Presumably um, cars could be moved from that space in the future. The proposed improvements to the building are interior, as I mentioned. Um, we've gone through both an administrative review for uh, the building addition as well as this special use permit that would allow full use of the building. Um, it would add space for interior um, uh, weights and the applicant can talk about that physical fitness element that they're adding to the building if you have questions about that. The overall site plan ties the two properties together. Staff's recommendation is for approval. There are a couple of conditions that are associated with this project. One such condition is to revise the plan to remove all references to KU. That's been a, project, a problem in the past. We want to make sure that we are not um, unintentionally using KU's name for this project. They're no longer affiliated with the project as staff understands it, so the plan needs to be revised to reflect that. And then there are a couple of conditions related to the city stormwater engineer, the need to designate a portion of that area, area either as an easement or some other tool or mechanism on the plan so that we are showing a restricted area for development on that western piece of that. The rest of the conditions are really fairly technical in nature, just some cleanup that needs to happen on the plan. Um, that we can work through with the applicant on those. And I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Okay, thank you, Sandy. Is the applicant present and wish to speak? Come on up. Hi, Letitia Cole, Paul Warner Architects. Um, I think we are, Sandy did a good job of explaining what we're, what we're doing, um, and we are good with all the conditions. There are only there's just two that I wanted to see if we could talk about a little bit. Um, number, well, it's G and then three and four. I don't know how to get those back up in front of you, but um, one of them talks about 12 trees along Clinton Parkway. We just wanted to make sure that um, we are fine with putting 12 trees. We wanted just to have a little bit of uh, leeway on where we could work with staff on where exactly those 12 trees went. Um, and then the other one, which is the G4, it's the provision of shrubs to create solid screening along the parking row parallel to Clinton Parkway. Um, I think I discussed this on the phone with, with staff. Um, we were thinking that that may not really be applicable in this, in this situation because we were not changing the parking. Um, so those are the two items that I wanted to see if we could reconsider. So, and I'm happy to answer any other questions. Okay. About it. All right, thank you. We'll let you know. Any members of the public wish to speak on this item or these two items? Again, we're taking both the rezoning and the special use permit up <coughs> together now for discussion, although we'll have separate motions. No members of the public? And we will close the public hearing. Bring it back up to the commission for discussion. Commissioner Denny. Simply to allow a parking lot in there? Is that the reason? It's an existing condition and it brings everything cohesively under one district. It's, it's more of an administrative okay. management tool for staff. Okay, but there's no possibility that there could actually be multi-dwellings multi, multi, multi no. built in that spillway. No. No. <laughs> okay, that's, as long as we're making sure that's not going to happen. Um, question for staff, would you care to comment on the change, potential changes to 
condition conditions two G three and four or III and sure. Um, with regard to street trees, um, I did go back and look at the approved subdivision plats that had master street tree plan associated with them. So that's the total number of trees. Um, where they get located, um, we certainly do have to manage whatever utilities are there, um, trying to get those properly located. The, the code talks about them spacing being one tree every 40 feet. Um, depending on what the circumstances are, when we get out into the field, we do sometimes see those adjustments being made in the field for the planting. So the location of the planting of the trees is, is not, I think, an issue. I think that's something that can be easily managed between the applicant and staff as we move through that project. Um, with regard to the solid screening, um, I did go back and look at some of the older plans as well as the fact that we're, we are changing the focus of this project, um, that this is a significant change to a degree um, in terms of what we're looking at, that it's appropriate to have good screening of the parking lot. This is a major corridor coming into the community. <coughs> Having appropriate screening, um, staff thinks is a, is a reasonable recommendation. Thank you. Other questions or discussion? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Commissioner Lee. Let me just ask about this motion. Um, no, okay, I see. So, 6A. Shall I start there? That would be a great place. Um, I move to recommend approval of the request to rezone approximately 14 plus. Uh, I guess it should say acres from general public and institutional district, uh, RM12 multi-dwelling residential district and RS40 single dwelling residential district to RM12. That's multi-dwelling residential district based on the findings presented in staff report and forwarding it to the city commission with a recommendation for approval. And do we have to add anything? Okay, I didn't think so. So that should do the trick. Good. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Commissioner Culver seconds. Discussion on the motion. Seeing no discussion. All those in favor, raise your hand. Another unanimous approval. Um, moving on to item 6B. Commissioner Lease. I move <laughs> to uh, recommend approval of the SUP for active recreation uses at 52 and 5300. Clinton Parkway forwarding that request to the City Commission with a recommendation for approval subject to the following conditions. One, two, A through H. And again, no modifications need to, I, I'm wondering if we. I, th I think the one modification that you have before you would be the, uh, whether the shrubs to create solid That's, screening. Yeah. And we think it's reasonable and, and comes closer to meeting the code than what exists today. So what do we need to? So if you if you support just staff's position and you don't do anything, you just approve recommend approval as written. And you'll take care of it. That's if you're not revising them, the, they'll stand as written. Sounds good to me. We have a motion. I'll second the motion. Any discussion? I will say that that is. Uh, I feel like the approaches to that property are. It's pretty prominent there, and so I agree that it's. Um, you know, it ought to be sort of landscaped and and uh, it ought to look nice. And I think it does right now, and it'll continue to look nice, especially with these additional trees or shrubs or however they end up going in. So appreciate staff's comments on that. What firm did you say you're with? Are you just what? Paul, Paul Warner Architects. Okay, I, I knew it was Paul Warner's project, and I thought you had said something else. No, good. <laughs> I thought there was a change of architects. <laughs> Because I, I read Paul Warner and I just hadn't heard, I, it sounded different to me. So thank you. There you go. Other discussion? Questions? Seeing <laughs> none. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Unanimously approved. Okay, item seven. This one will not get eight votes in favor, but it might get six or it might get zero. <laughs> <coughs> That's probably a good idea. Let's um, 
Let's take a seven minute break. We'll come back at, uh, I'm getting confused by this clock, 7.45. It's a difficult clock. Well, the, the second, the minute and the hour are right next to you. We'll come back at 7.45 with item seven. And in the meantime, the Planning Commission will not discuss that or any other item in the back. reconvene and uh, we will jump right into item seven we are down to six members um, with abstentions from vice chair Kelly and Commissioner Culver and we are ready to go good evening commissioners I'm Catherine Simmons with the planning office I'm here to present item number seven um, which is before you now is a rezoning from approximately 9.72 acres um, from a current zoning of IG to IL. I mean, it's located um, at the intersection of East 31st Street and the new Haskell Interchange. And here you can see on the map um, what the surrounding zoning for this area is. The property is outlined in turquoise stone here. Um, it is currently in an IG district, so there would be IG on both sides. Um, it's going for IL. Um, which there is IL to the, just to the north of it, IG a little bit to the northwest, and then there's some GPI um, just to the north of um, the IL district, which will be relative um, in a moment because we have some communications from the property owner for the GPI. Um, there's some residential. I didn't hear the last thing you said. I heard you say because there's another part of Oh, I'm sorry. Because the um, it'll be relative to you in a moment because the GPI property, which is north of the IL, um, that we have communications regarding this application from that particular property owner. Which Thank is you. That's the yeah. <coughs> so um, part of the reason for uh, or the reasoning behind uh, the request from uh, rezoning from an IG which is general industrial to IL, the current uses um, for an IG district are um, things like building maintenance, uh, construction sales and services, um, all of our industrial uses, all of our wholesale storage and distribution for all categories, vehicle sales and service. Um, the particular um, development opportunity um, currently is for something that we categorize as uh, participation sports rec or participation recreation indoor, um, which um, this particular applicant is proposing a gun range, an indoor gun range and associated shop with that, which is why there is a a need for rezoning because current zoning does not currently allow those participate participation sports and recreation uses um, the IL which is the limited industrial district opens the opportunity up a little bit more um, it does allow the particip participation participant sports and recreation um, and all categories of that indoor outdoor and passive recreation um, it also opens it up for office things like health clinic um, some general retail sales and service, which is relevant to this because there would be an associated ancillary shop with this proposed use. So this opens the property up a little bit more and um, would permit the proposed use um, in the zoning district, which is still characteristic of the remaining um, zoning surrounding zone. Um, the current existing situation on the site is a vacant industrial storage building. Um, it was formerly a, ma a manufacturing and production limited um, use for Balfour silk screening. Um, so that was a more of a light use uh, manufacturing production. Um, the proposed use for which has prompted the rezoning re request is for indoor gun range and ancillary shop. <coughs> um, we did receive um, outside communication for this project. As I mentioned before, um, that communication from USD 497, who is the owner of the GPI property just to the north of the IL. Um, that is general public and institutional use. Um, that's also the location for the College and Career Center. Um, this property that is requesting the rezoning is located approximately 760 feet from the Lawrence College and Career Center. That's from property line to property line. Um, and the proposed rezoning and use conforms to the codes and regulations, um, but the communication that has come forward from USD 497 is going to bring your attention to some federal um, gun regulation acts that are in effect. 
<clears throat> Upon, should you approve this um, rezoning application, uh, the required actions as next steps would be uh, the city commission approval would also have to take place and then approval and publication of the ordinance um, for the rezoning. They would also have to submit a site plan, which would have to go through site planning approval, um, and an application and release of building permits. Staff is recommending approval of the rezoning request from IG, which is General Industrial, District to IL, Limited Industrial, and forwarding it to the City Commission with a re recommendation for approval based on the finding of fact in the staff report. And I would be happy to answer any additional questions or after you've had a moment to hear the Okay. I would also, actually I can bring this up before I leave here, if you need a map for reference, a larger map, I would put that up for you. It'll take a moment to load that. Okay, thank you very much. Is the applicant present? Wish to speak? My name is Rick Sells, and I'll apologize in advance. I'm probably the one that's going to keep you here till midnight. Uh, we won't let you do that. <laughs> um, I didn't know I only had three minutes to speak, and I brought about 40 minutes worth of stuff. So. Well, and in fact, the, the time limitations for members of the public are different from the time limitations we usually use for applicants. Oftentimes, they don't use it all, but you can go up to 10 minutes if you'd like. Okay. Well, first I'd like to let you know that I know that a reason a lot of headbanging goes together is due to education and people don't understand things and what has to go on. Uh, I've been looking for almost a year to find a building in Lawrence that I can do this in. I found two. Uh, when you're looking for a building, you have to find one that's large enough and you have to find one that has a concrete floor in it. Then you have to find a, someone who owns a building that's willing to let you go in and build a 58 foot by 130 foot concrete square container inside their building which most people are not too acceptable of that and then once you build this great big concrete box you have to fill it with 3 8 inch steel uh, that's armor pier well, not armor piercing but is not affected by armor piercing bullets so as you end up making a box that's big enough to put the range in but it's safe no bullet can escape then on top of that, you have to be able to put in an air supply system and an EPA approved HEPA air system so that anything that comes out of there, which could be dust, gunpowder, smoke, smell, that comes out of there and is, and is put out into the public air is approved by the EPA. And so when you're gonna do that to someone's building, it, it takes a lot to find someone who's willing to let you do that. I found two locations in town and I can't say that either one of them are the probably I mean the one I'm talking about tonight's the best of the two that I've got so far that I've found and I've probably been in every rental building in Lawrence uh, I know that the, the my opposition tonight is bringing you a uh, law or an act that's been that was put into effect in 1996 that act states that no one can have a gun or discharge a gun within a thousand feet of a school it's a free school gun act uh, and, I, and I understand why they did that uh, they had to have a number uh, I don't it could have been 500 it could have been 5,000 feet I mean they put a number that they thought they could that they could live with in July of 2014 uh, Derek Schmidt signed into a new law which opened up open carry and conceal and carry to where anyone in Kansas can carry a gun on their hip or carry a gun under their shirt and they don't have to take classes they just automatically can do that because they're a citizen of Kansas whether I believe in that or not I don't want to get into that tonight that's not the topic but by doing that it opens up some uh, it takes away some of the restrictions from that thousand foot barrier that was put in in the 1996 uh, zoning deal um, what it says is if you read the law that they put into a place any person can walk up to a school with a gun or a handgun as long as they don't open the door and walk in they haven't violated the law it also says that if you're shooting guns on private land that's approved also so 
when you dwell into this, I understand the reason why they did in 1996, but in 2014 that was updated by the new law that was brought into Kansas, which is the open carry and concealed carry law. Uh, I'll try to make this as short as I can. Uh, I wanted to bring it to staff's attention that uh, last week I went out with my little walking wheel and I went down to uh, the community center on, at 115 West 11th Street. And if you walk from their property line south, approximately 630 feet, you'll find yourself standing in the middle of uh, St. John's Catholic School. If you go north from the community building, less than 700 feet, you'll find yourself in front of the United, give me a second. the First United Methodist Church, which they have a private daycare preschool in that facility. And if you walk right across the street to Plymouth Congregational Church, they have a private uh, preschool in there. And I believe the President of the United States was in the front page of the Lawrence Journal World while he was visiting that facility. So it is there which means that for the past 19 years, the city of Lawrence has operated a gun range inside the thousand foot rule of this law, which came about in 1996. Uh, and that gun range, I think, has been there for quite some time. Uh, the reason I know the gun range is on there is because if you go online, you can download all the information that you need to know about the gun range and how to join it, everything about it. So for the last 19 years, no one's complained that a gun range was located within a thousand foot of a proprial school, which this gun law, this thousand foot range gun law encompasses and it also encompasses private schools. So you got two private schools that's encompassed. So as long as they've been there, nothing's been said and uh, I don't want to come across as not having feelings for what the school district is saying about having a gun facility that close to a school, but the law has pretty much overstepped that boundary of that. I do understand that city codes and laws override state codes and laws, which override federal codes and laws. So it would mean that in July of 2014, when Mr. Schmidt put this into effect, it pretty much overrode whatever the federal law was to be. Now, I'm not a lawyer, don't know that, I'm just going by what I've read and all the laws that I've read. So, uh, if you have any questions, I'd be more than glad to answer them. Okay, thank you. We'll let you know if we do have questions. All right, we'll move into the public comment portion of our hearing. Any members of the public wish to speak? If so, come on up to the podium, sign in, tell us your name. Uh, remember, if you're an individual, we're all individuals. But if you're not, let's say, if you're not representing an organization or a neighborhood association or that kind of thing, then you get three minutes. If you are representing some other organization, you get five minutes. And we have a handy clock right over here. Thank you. Um, do I have permission to provide a handout to the commissioners? Uh, we don't, we have a... Just for a, illustration purposes. To you, you don't need to hand us anything. We've got an Elmo okay, here great. that you can use and then you can great. point. Thank you. I think it's an Elmo. It may not technically be an Elmo. It's what we affectionately call it. Okay. It's a colloquialism. It's probably... Right. It's like getting somebody a, some Kleenex. You, you have an elbow, that's right. And you use it. If you can see it on your monitors, I'll go ahead. Well, we'll, it, yeah, we can okay. only see whatever's on the TVs, okay. so. Right. Yes. So we'll wait and get it right. 
Thank okay. you. Good Go evening, ahead. Commissioners. My name is Shannon Kimball, and I am a member of the USD 497 Board of Education, and I appear before you this evening on behalf of the Board of Education in opposition to this rezoning request. Um, I understand that you have received a copy of the letter that our board uh, sent to this Planning Commission outlining our objections to this particular zoning change. I'm here to elaborate on those objections. Respectfully, um, the, city's plan the city planning staff's favorable recommendation does not give appropriate consideration to the district's safety and security concerns, nor does it correctly address the impact of the Federal Gun Free School Zones Act on the affected parties. As some background, in August of this year, the school district opened our new college and career center um, at 31st and Haskell, which is <coughs> labeled on the Elmo right here, Lawrence College and Career Center. Um, across, and it's across the intersection from the property that's at issue in this request. In fact, it's a mere 760 feet from our property to the proposed site of this gun sale shop. Our district has invested over $6 million in this facility. In addition, the city and the county have invested a substantial ad additional dollars in our partner facility that's at this location, Peasley Technical Center, which is um, our facility is this one right here. Peasley Tech is this building right here. Um, <clears throat> for the purpose of creating a college and career training campus that in the future in partnership with the Boys and Girls Club we anticipate will be serving children as young as 10 years old. The safety and security of our students and faculty at our school facilities is of the utmost importance and concern to us and it drives our opposition to this zoning re rezoning request. Contrary to the staff analysis, rezoning of this parcel will detrimentally affect our neighboring school site. In fact, the analysis of the neighboring site that's in the documents, it references Peasley Tech, but it doesn't really, really specifically reference the College and Career Center, so I just wanted to point that out. Um, I submit that the, a gun sale outlet and shooting range and repair facility is not a use that's compatible with the neighboring educational use that we have. Um, it's been noted that the rezoning and use are technically legal in the, in the staff report. Um, however, this fact, the fact that it's legal doesn't necessarily mean that it's a correct or a desirable application of good planning principles in this instance. Uh, for safety and security reasons, the Gun-Free School Zone Act creates a 1,000-foot gun-free buffer around school district property. And I'm going to pause here from my prepared comments for a minute to, to address the specifics of what that act actually requires. Um, I think we provided some information to you about that. Um, it creates a 1,000 foot zone around the property line of our school, school district property. And the blue circle that's on, that's here, shows um, a 1,000 foot zone that extends from the, the southern corner of our property. And you can see the, the applicants, uh, the property that's at issue is marked with the red, um, with the red star there. What it says is that if you are in a state that has, that requires a concealed carry license, um, it, it does not require, this Gun Free School Zones Act does not require you to have a weapon unloaded and in a locked container as you pass through the school zone. In a state like Kansas, because of the recent change that was made to our statutes about concealed carry, we no longer require a license for, for concealed carry. So what the federal act actually says about that is that you, if you have a gun in the school zone, it is supposed to be unlocked and it is supposed to be unloaded and in a locked container. And I think that um, that's really imp an important thing to note. I, I, I disagree with Mr. Sell's characterization of what the federal statute requires in that regard. Um, I, Kansas law does not supersede the federal statute in that respect. It, it, in fact, in some ways, it made application of the federal law different than what it would have been in previous years when we had a concealed carry license statute. Um, our school district, our staff, and our parents are entitled to the protection that we get from this federal law, as, as little as you may think that it is, we, we feel that it's important. As the handout that I'm sharing illustrates, there's actually not an entrance onto this property that you can get to that doesn't require you to pass through the, the thousand foot buffer zone. And I, and I think that's really important because allowing the rezoning and use of this property 
would make repeated violations of, of the federal act almost a certainty. Um, if you have people traveling to and from a gun sale shop um, to purchase firearms, et cetera. Um, now granted, Gun Free School Zones Act does not apply to the particular activities that happen on the private property, but it does apply to all those paths of travel that are not on the private property. Um, you know, the, it, in that sense, the, the detriment to the school district is very real. As, as the proposed use exposes us to those repeated violations of these safety and security um, precautions that are in the statute um, and protections. Um, and, I, and I submit to you that the detriment does outweigh the interests of the applicant in this case in going forward with the rezoning. Um, staff did correctly note that the federal Ms. Kimball, you're over your time, I so am, please wrap up. Oh, I'm up. so sorry. That's okay. Um, in summary, I just ask that you consider um, denying this request, please respect and, and help us support the protections that we do have available to us to support safety and security for our staff and our families and, 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 and pr help protect our investment that we've made in this, in this facility and in, in the students in our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Other public comment? Evening commissioners, Colby Wilson, director for the Boys and Girls Club. Thank you for the time. I am, uh, I'm here representing the Boys and Girls Club and uh, we are in the middle of a campaign to build a new teen center that's gonna serve five times as many middle school and high school students right next to the College and Career Center. And in general, we would have no impact um, on our community, on the, and on, on the kids we serve without the support from parents, community members, uh, government, both local, state, and federal, and, and business leader, leaders in this community. And the bedrock of that support is the expectation that we provide a safe place, both emotionally and physically. If we fail to meet that expectation, uh, that support goes away. And we're no longer serving 3,000 kids uh, in Lawrence every day, and our hopes for uh, what we have planned for the teen center probably will go away as well. Um, I've tried to go into this, uh, this issue open-minded. I've spoken to Mr. Sells. I think he has good intentions for education and safety. Um, but I've talked to a lot of other people, board members, business leaders, community members, parents, and I've yet to find someone who thinks that, uh, in general, building a, or having a, a gun sale shop, uh, a shooting range, uh, close to a boys and girls club in a school is a good idea. So, um, you know, as Shannon described, there's just too many things outside of our control, outside of Mr. Sell's control, as far as uh, safety. So, um, from the boys and girls club perspective, we, uh, respect that we respectively um, request that you deny this rezoning request. Thank you. Thank you. Other public comment? <clears throat> Hi, good evening. I'm Randy Maston, and uh, I'm here on my own, so I guess I get three minutes. Um, I'd just like to say up front, I cannot recall a worse idea proposed in the city of Lawrence in recent times in allowing the construction of a gun store and firing range in close proximity to one of our schools. I'm not anti-guns. I'm the son of a police officer, a chief of police for that matter. My brother was a police officer and my godfather and most of my adult role models were policemen. Guns were a part of my life. I started shooting at the age of five. I grew up in Kansas, Wisconsin, and Texas as an avid hunter. Additionally, I'm a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the United States Army, where I served in both infantry and aviation units, commonly referred to as combat arms, and I also own several firearms. However, I am against guns in and near our schools. This is a terrible idea. I was on the USD 497 Board of Education from 2011 to 2015. I would not have voted in favor of building the 
uh, career and community center near a weapons range or a gun store. I also do not believe the people of Lawrence voted to pass a $92.5 million bond to improve the quality and safety of our schools, only to have the city allow a firing range and gun store located next to one of our schools. There's also a plan, as was stated earlier, to build the new Boys and Girls Club facility adjacent to the CCC. Once again, putting more children in this area. And there was a finding at the end of the report that was given to you that said uh, that it was compatible with the surrounding development. It is not compatible with the surrounding development. The surrounding development focuses on education and children. We do not allow bars, establishments with nudity or pornography, or other such businesses near our schools. Why? Because people do not believe it is conducive to the safety or education of our children. This is not a good idea for our children. It's not a good idea for the faculty and staff of USD 497, the parents, or the city of Lawrence. And I would ask that you honestly think about you know, what we're, we're doing. We're putting a, a, a gun shop and a weapons range just across the street from an area that's going to house a lot of uh, of our children, and the idea that you know somehow that you know everybody that comes and goes from there is going to be safe to handle a firearm it is ridiculous. And now that the state has seen it in its interest to uh, remove the concealed carry, that federal regulation becomes more constrictive, not less. So I think that you know we're putting even our citizens at jeopardy of violating a law they don't know it exists. And Mr. Sells apparently doesn't know the implications of this either, and he's the one proposing that we build this. So I would just like to say that I hope you disapprove this request for rezoning. Thank you, Mr. Madston. Other public comment? Hi, I'm Chris Lane. I think that this should go through. I have several facts that show that this has already been done in the United States before. In the state of um, Colorado, you have a school called the School of Trades. It's a gunsmithing school with three to 4,000 guns passed through that school every year. Not one incident has happened where somebody's been harmed. Not only that, there's three other schools that are within 1,000 yards or 1,000 feet of the school. And none of the other surrounding schools have a problem with it because it does not cause a problem for the surrounding schools. Also in, in um, Virginia and Illinois, there's two other shop slash gun facilities that are right across the street from schools. And in both those schools, those have been there for three years now. And there's not been one instance of an area around there that's been harmed by any gun fatalities. In fact, 80% of gun fatalities and gun injuries in this country are caused by guns that have been, have been bought illegally. Most of the guns that have, have to do with gun ranges and gun facilities and repair shops are guns that are regulated strictly by the ATF very, very hardly. So it's very hard for somebody to come in and buy a gun illegally and cause mayhem. So basically, this has been done many, many times in this country already, and there hasn't been a problem yet that has come with it. Having a gun facility near a school does not increase the chances of gun violence happening in a school. Many other things can lead to that, but not a gun facility. Thank you. Just, Thank you for your comment. I just didn't hear your name or I'm Chris. And where do you Chris Lane. Chris Lane. I'm a citizen of Lawrence, Kansas, grew up here, graduated from Lawrence. That's all I want to know. I just I hadn't heard that part. Thank you. <coughs> Additional public comment? <coughs> Seeing none, we will close the public hearing. And if the applicant, Mr. Sell, if you have any response or want to <coughs> discuss any of the issues that have been raised, you have uh, five minutes to do so. Yeah, I understand where the school board's coming from, and I understand that. But to stand up here and say that a gun gun range is going to be unsafe, uh, I think they're looking at the wrong end of the gun. Uh, State of Kansas did a, a poll. They asked people in Kansas to tell them if they had a gun, and I'm sure that not everybody that had a gun told them, and everybody who was in part of that poll told them. But from what they did find out, they found out that over between 30 and 40% of the housing in Kansas has a gun in it. And it may not be owned by the people who, 
who own the house, but it's owned by somebody that lives in that house, in that, in that facility. So if you take that into consideration and figure there's 90,000 people in Lawrence, that means there's approximately 30,000 guns in Lawrence, which I would be more than likely to say there's probably closer to 50 or 60,000 guns, because I know very few gun owners that own one gun. They normally have three or four or five. If you sprinkle them guns all over Lawrence and you take into consideration every preschool, every private school, every parochial school, every elementary school, every junior high and every high school, you're not going to tell me that a house within a thousand feet or within a hundred feet of a school doesn't have a gun in it. Now is that person trained? Who knows? Is that person, was that gun bought legally or illegal? Who knows? Those are the people you ought to be worried about, not somebody who's going to put into a facility that is first of all going to work with the Douglas County Police Department, the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, the KU Police Department, to try to make a safe environment for people and on top of that we plan to do a lot of learning. We want to make kids under the age of 18 learn about guns, gun safety, the harm. If you look at what kids do today, they get out of school, they go home and they get on their Xbox and what do they do? Play call to action. They shoot all these people down, bam, 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 then they eat supper, they do the homework, they go to school, they come back tomorrow, they push the reset button and people jump up and they shoot them all again. These kids need to realize that when you shoot somebody with a gun, they're probably not going to pop up tomorrow and play the game with you. And there's a lot of education that we plan to do through this facility to kids under the age of 18. We also plan to do a, a, a learning thing with women. It's called Pink Pistol Night. It'll be the first and third Thursday and every night where we're going to try to train women about guns, about safety of a gun, how to use a gun, gun range etiquette. When you go through the whole facility, basically what we're opening up is a, a way to teach people to be safe with guns. And so for these people to say that just because we open up a gun range, it's going to be unsafe, I disagree with them 100%. I would think that you would want to see a facility in Lawrence that is owned by an ex-school teacher that's going to teach safety to the people that come through there. If you could see our rules and regulations, you would say, I'm not going to join your club because I don't want to stand there and sign all that paperwork to become a member. I have to check every person that comes in my club to make sure they do not have a felony. I cannot allow, a, because I have an FFL and an SOT license, it ties me into the, every FBI, AT, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms, it ties me into all of those people, and it says that I cannot let a felon shoot in my club. So I am going to have to do background checks on every person that comes in there. If it's one or 1,000, every one of them have a background check on them, and I can't let those people with a felony shoot in my club. So we're going to check the people, we're putting in complete security, and we're, we're trying to provide a facility that will provide these people with the learning of safety of guns. So I don't know. If you have any questions, I'll be more than glad to answer. We'll certainly let you know if we have any. Thank you. All right, we will bring this up to the commission for discussion. Questions? Commissioner Sands. Uh, we are, heard two arguments on uh, how the federal law applies. Do we have, can we get city attorney opinion? Yes. Um, Gun Free Zone, School Zone Act of 1990, <coughs> amended by the Honest Consolidated Appropriations Act of 1997, went into effect in 1996. Basically, what that does is limits possession of firearms within a thousand feet of school. There are certain exceptions. It doesn't apply to private property. So it wouldn't apply basically to the property outside that's not the school zone. And it doesn't apply if you have an, if you're in a motor vehicle and it is uh, not loaded and it's in a box. Um, other than that, uh, that's, that's what it does. It doesn't prohibit a shooting range, doesn't prohibit the discharge of firearms on private property within that thousand feet, that's, that's what it would apply to. So based on that, in our opinion, although there are certain restrictions, um, I don't know that it would necessarily prohibit this. The main argument seems to be that people may be traveling on the highway to get to this place in violation, but if they're doing that at this place, I mean, you can't drive through Lawrence without coming within thousand feet of a school. So, I mean, that would be, that would be considered, so. Anyway, it's the opinion of the city attorney's office that 
while this provides certain protections, it would not probably prohibit this use on that property. Thank you. Thanks. Commissioner Von Aachen. Mr. Was it Wilson? Can you show us on here for the Boys and Girls uh, what Pink Center is planned to be? Um, yes. We are actually going to build right next to the College and Career Center right here. We're actually going to connect to the College and Career Center and build in this area. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Another Sanders. question for you, sir. Uh, <laughs> has the board already made a determination that that's going to be the final site for your? Yes. Okay. okay. So if the if this were to be approved by the planning commission and the city commission, would what effect would that have on the board's plans? We would move forward. Um, I think there would, you know, there there's a feeling that it could have an impact on some of the efforts that we have to raise the money we need to build this facility. Okay. Thank you. Other discussion or questions? Go ahead, Commissioner Denny. <coughs> a couple of, uh, one, perhaps with yourselves. Uh, what caliber weapons are you looking at having in here? What's your maximum? The ranges themselves are 75 feet long or 25 feet. Uh, most of what will be shot in there will be handguns. I would imagine most of it will be 22, maybe some 9 millimeter. I'm not going to tell you that somebody's not going to show up with a 45 or a 44 Magnum. The ballistics on these, on the, the ranges that I'm putting in, is that the 3 8 ballistic metal that they're using to build them with and the fact that there'll be a six six inch concrete wall behind them but the ballistic metal that they're using will, will handle any weapon with a with a muzzle velocity of 3600 feet per second which will take you all the way up to a 300 wind mag but i will tell you uh i don't know why anyone with a 300 wind mag or a 308 would want to try to sight their guns in on a 25 foot range i would see them out at their buddy's farm trying to sight that thing in at 100 yards uh, will I allow a 300 wind mag? No. The only two rifles, three rifles I'm going to allow in there is a 22, which will be most of what people will shoot. Uh, I will, they will accept an AR-15 and it will accept a 300 uh, blackout. But other than that, I'm not going to allow anything. No, 500, no uh, 50 caliber BMGs, no 408 shy techs, no 338 Lapuas, you know, nothing of that effect. And it, it'd be really stupid for somebody to try to come in there and sight their gun in that, you know, if you're used to shooting a half a mile with it, shooting 25 yards is not going to do much for you. Yeah, I was just trying to get at what yeah. power level of weapons yeah. you're talking about. I would imagine that most of it, uh, if, if we expand to go from 10 lanes to 15 lanes, we have a section in there that we're going to put in that will only be 15 yards, which will, will be the last five lanes we put in if we can do it. and that will be all handguns because who wants to shoot a rifle 15 feet? So I, not even a 22 rifle. But I would imagine most of what we do, especially with kids, will be done with Remington 22 single shot. You know, we might use some 22 with clips. And I'm sure that some of the kids are going to want to use the AR format with a 22 that has a 10 round mag in it so they can shoot that, I would imagine. And the other thing that's going to deter a lot of this is the cost. You know, you can shoot a 22 for about seven cents a shell, where a 223 AR-15 is going to run you 60 cents a shell. So you shoot 100 shells and you shot 60 bucks, and you know it gets pretty cost preventative. So. Okay, that answered my question. Other discussion or questions? I'll I'll just note. I, I mean, I there's some discussion about you know any conflicts in federal and state and municipal law and things of that nature. I haven't certainly looked into any of this, but I do remember from law school that um, if, if anything we do tonight conflicts or if any state law that we're talking about conflicts with a, a federal law, then the federal law is going to take priority over that. So I think we do need to be a little bit concerned about the 
um, gun free school zone act and think about that we can't just brush it aside because you know that we now have uh, unlicensed conceal carry and open carry laws in Kansas and that kind of thing to the extent those um, might allow you to do something somewhere else that federal law is still going to have some effect on the way that people are allowed to possess or use weapons within a hundred within a thousand feet of a school so um, I do it seems to me that the city attorney uh, city attorney's office and Randy is correct that there's nothing about this that necessarily conflicts with that federal law um, so to me the real hard question is just the safety issue I mean that's um, that's one of the golden factors is you know it, compatibility with nearby uses and I think the school zone or the school um, building and the Boys and Girls Club uh, use are are right in the mix we need to be thinking about those things and the impact of this potential use there so I haven't made up my mind one way or the other but I do think we need to satisfy ourselves of those concerns Mr. yeah Mr. Sands I have another question for the applicant, please. Um, you mentioned you were working with Douglas County Sheriff K Public Safety. Is there any official correspondence that I haven't done anything with it because at this point I don't know what I'm going to do. Okay. Wherever I do put it, I want you to know that I, uh, I plan to work with them. Uh, I have talked with, uh, whether you know it or not, now the fire department and the uh, paramedics are required to to wear guns and they're quite required to get qualified as per has been told to me by one of the head of the fire department uh, they want to see this happen they've been they've asked if will the city and the, everybody get a special rate so that they because they'll be in there all the time trying to get qualified because they have to qualify to carry the gun uh, I've been approached by the National Guard I've been told that there's close to 2,000 people here in Lawrence that belong to the National Guard and right now they're having to drive to Topeka or Kansas City because they have to get qualified twice a year. Oh, sorry, sir. Uh, who in the National Guard have you spoken to? Pardon me? Who? Which I just talked to a gentleman that's in the National Guard. I, I can't, his last name's Rogers. I can't remember his first name. Uh, but he was telling me that uh, he's a, he told me, well, I, I met, I was at a swim meet with my daughter when we were sitting there talking about it. His last name's Rogers, and I'll think of his first name here in a minute. But anyway, he said that there's a lot of people here. They have to get qualified. They're having to drive to Topeka or Kansas City to get qualified because the National Guard people, to be able to carry a, an arm, has to qualify twice a year with a certain kind of score. So, uh, you know, that's going. So I've talked to them. Uh, I don't. At the time this all happened, I didn't know this was all going to go to the press and be on the API wire and go everywhere. I was wanting to get the facility that I'm going to use in place and know that it's going to happen before I run around to the police department and say, hey, look what I'm doing, and then have to go back and go, oh, no, I'm not doing that. But, so I was trying to do that. But uh, I've had people on the, on the police department. I've had people on the Douglas County Sheriff's Department, and I've had people who know people on the KU Police Department that said that they would be very interested in using the facility if it happens. Okay, I, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the key distinction needs to be made that though that these are members of these organizations that may have spoken to the applicant and given their personal approval of this, but this is not anything official. Is that a no, correct statement? Correct, sir. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that clarification. <clears throat> Commissioner Von Aachen? Is the shooting range in the community building still there? Yes, ma'am. It's, uh, I'll give you this. This is the application you can. Well, just sir, why don't you just well, use the Elmo there? Pages. Uh, this is an application that tells about what they do. Welcome to the Douglas County Rifle Pistol Club information. They're opened up Monday through Fridays from 7 p.m. to 8.45 yeah. p.m. Tells a little bit about it. The next thing is the rules and safety rules that they have. Okay, that, that's so, fine. I just, th yeah. thank you. My, my other question is, um, who do, what kind of people do you hire to do the, the teaching? Well, first of all, just I in to, general. First of all, I have, I've got to find qualified people, but I didn't want to hire staff. Uh, right, be, I understand. Be, you know, it's but a they've got to be qualified. There's several tests and, and systems that the NRA provide that they're going to have to go through. Uh, because I do sell guns and I am an FFL, they are, they are welcome to work underneath my federal firearms license, but then if they do something wrong, I could lose my license. 
So I'm going to require them to go through the whole process to get their own federal firearms license, which means they will be approved by the FBI, the ATF, uh, the DOJ, uh, you know, state of Kansas. Uh, everybody has to. I, so. I just wondered if they had to be yeah. somehow licensed. Yeah. Thank you very much. Commissioner Lease. Uh, I, I want to preface this in order to uh, make sure that there's no concern about my bias. Um, I was probably within the first hundred people to get a concealed carry license and I have maybe a dozen guns at home. At least uh, three quarters of them are handguns. So I have no opposition to handguns. I enjoy gun stores. I find them interesting. Um, and when I have to, I go to uh, Cabela's <laughs> or somewhere like that. Um, so my biggest question for you is what percent of the people who come in do you have to say, um, since you do have to screen them for felonies and stuff, how often do you have to say, I'm sorry, I can't serve you? Well, with the, I don't know if you know what the NICS program is, but it's an information you fill out, you submit it, and probably within 30 to 40 seconds, they'll tell you whether, on most of them. Uh, anybody that doesn't pass that, I'll, I'll have to let them go. I can't have them in there. Right. How often does that happen? Uh, I don't, with me, it hadn't happened very often because I haven't sold a, a, a thug or a felon a, a gun. You know, I mean, most of the people, when they walk up to you, you kind of can get a feel for them. But f with me, I couldn't tell you. To be able to give you a statistical number of how many felons are in Lawrence that's going to want to come into the club, I don't know how many <coughs> felons live here. I really appreciate what you're trying to do. Having spent a lot of time around the bullet hole uh, in, in Kansas City area, um, my big concern isn't your business or the range or anything like that. It's the people that come in that you have to turn away because they are still in the area of the school. And it's no fault of yours at all, and it's certainly no fault of the handgun that, that those people want guns. And I, I am. 100% confident that you never sell guns to those people because I know, I know how much risk it puts you at. But my concern is those people who, I mean, I've, I've been in gun stores where those people have to be turned away and they're, they're scary folk, which is why they have to be turned away. So my concern is, is not your good customers, it's your not good customers. So and I assume also, you, with all those walls and everything, that box that there's no sound outside. Uh, I'm not going to tell you that there won't be some sound. Pops. Yeah, pops. But you're not going to hear boom, boom, boom. Right. Yeah, I figured and, that. And, the, and the, 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 the preceding thing that you were into, uh, we have a strict set of rules. Uh, if you would read my rules, you'd think I'm nuts, but you're not allowed to enter my club with a hoodie or a duffel bag. No, that's smart. I, I, if you're walking the door, the hoodie comes off, you better not have a duffel bag. You better have a gun bag or a, a gun case. Uh, you have to have your pants up around your hips because I don't want somebody walking across the floor and flipping over their pants and shooting somebody. Shoestrings have to be tied. You have to have a shirt with sleeves on it. So you can't wear a tank top. You can't wear a sleeveless shirt. It, it goes on and on and on, the rules I have. In fact, I have a sheet that you're going to have to fill out to join, and then I have a sheet that you're going to fill out for rules, and then I have another sheet you have to fill out about ammunition and what you're going to shoot and what you're responsible for. So it, it's not just a fly-by-night. I've been working on this thing for over a year, and I've talked to every gun facility that I can talk to from Hawaii to South Carolina and getting their input on what they're doing. I've had a club in St. Louis. It's a third generation club that's invited me to come over and spend, a, if I get this up and going, to come spend a week with them and see how they run their facility. They have an indoor facility. They have an outdoor facility. And they just built a new indoor archery range. So uh, again, you, that your, again, your yeah, your credibility is, is not what I'm questioning right. at all. It's really, it's having been around gun stores where there are so many people who are unsavory by no no fault of yours whatsoever. So well, I, I think with, when people find out our rules and regulations and it gets out there, the, I hate to say the people you don't want to have there, but the word to get out. I mean, you know, if you go to a bar and it doesn't like certain things or you have to wear a suit and tie, the word gets around and you don't go there because you don't want to wear a suit and tie. So, but I, I understand where you're coming from. There, there are people that you can't control. There are people I can't control. Yeah. There are not people that they can't control. Uh, the police department can't control, you know. Uh, well, thank you. That's helpful. Okay. I really appreciate it. Other discussion? Questions? 
Commissioner Denny. I read the laws here and the research I've done on this it says right here, the federal law, and I agree with you, takes precedence over state law. Um, but in this case, the federal law has all sorts of exceptions, and it's kind of interesting, I think, to look through what those exceptions are. In the state of Kansas, if you are licensed to have a concealed carry, or you're a retired law enforcement officer, that thousand foot rule does not apply. Um, and in fact, one reading of it uh, that I, that I, one interpretation of it that I read, you know, would include any guns manufactured in the state of Kansas. So someone who does not have a license but is carrying a gun that is manufactured in the state of Kansas, federal law wouldn't apply to them either. Um, to make a, a simple blanket statement, I think is, is perhaps over, overdoing it. Um, the other thing, and, and I agree that the issue here is the safety more than what the legal status is. Um, I actually did go and drive the area there and look at it, and I think it's, it's interesting that, because my first thought was, well, that's pretty darn close. Um, but then I did go and, and drive it, and the elevation, the, the picture there is somewhat deceiving in terms of the elevation. If you're up on the, the school property, it's quite a ways down to the building where this, this uh, uh, facility is going to be. Uh, one of my concerns, obviously, was stray rounds going somewhere. Um, from my observation, it seemed that it would be very unlikely that a, a stray round from inside that facility would impact the school property or the building that's up there. Um, so it comes down to, I think, what Commissioner Lisa's concern is, in my mind, uh, is the, uh, is this an attractive nuisance? Uh, does it, is it equal to uh, an adult uh, business or some other activity like that that's within a thousand feet of the school? Um, the other thing, if you drive the area, you look at uh, what's, how prominent is this business from the school property and from most of the school property and what I could get in, you know, the parking lots and such, it's not even really visible. I don't know, am I correct there? If I'm, if I'm wrong, please correct me. Uh, but it's, it's not prominent is what I'm getting at. There's no attractiveness uh, from people, from children uh, being at the school and having this blinking neon sign in their eye. Wait, that, if, if I'm wrong, please say so. Um, and Ms. Kimball, why don't you come on up and answer that specific issue? And um, sure. So um, you can't see the business building from the parking lot because the parking lot is actually behind the college and career center. It, the parking area for our building is here. Mm -hmm. um, all of, one of the cool design features of this building is that the ends of the building, um, and in particular this end right here, large banks of windows. Now, I didn't go out there myself and, and stand, but I can tell you that there are quite a number of expansive views across this intersection from inside our building that you wouldn't be able to see from the parking, yeah, the parking I, area. Um, I, I drove around yeah. the, the south end there, but I was not in the building, so I don't right. know what you can see right. from inside. The um, and I, you know, I don't have any pictures of that that I can, that I can share. So. Um, at any rate, I just want to point out that while it, it is close, it's not right across the street. Uh, when you say it's across the street, it's, it's a bit of a different situation than just right across the street. Um, I would also point out that, um, as has been mentioned, there's, or there are other ranges in the city of Lawrence, and, and I, perhaps you can answer, is the National Guard range at 21st Street still active? Or, yeah, at the facility there at 21st and Iowa. That's a reserve. That's a reserve. That's a reserve. I'm part. And I don't. I don't think they've got a uh, indoor range. They did have. I, don't, I just don't know if it's still operating. Dollars to donuts, and I can't speak to the specifics of that range. But the uh, indoor ranges that the guard has operated in the past have all been shut down due to the expense of okay. uh, lead mitigation and uh, <clears throat> adherence to EPA. Okay. Uh, that was one of the questions I had. I didn't mm -hmm. know if that one was still operating or not. 
but there is a range, you mentioned the bullet hole in Overland Park, which is in a residential area. Uh, in Ottawa, there's a gun range shop uh, on Main Street, right across the street from the courthouse, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, this is not something that's unheard of uh, uh, or is, you know, absolutely not done. And that would be all I had to say at this point. Okay. Commissioner Lease. Um, yeah, I know I said this. I really want to make it clear that I am, uh, we're all going to, I think especially on something, on an issue this uh, sensitive, we, we all have a responsibility to say how we're going to vote and why. Um, it's often said when a developer comes into town, usually from outside, and they, they want to build in a place that the community is not comfortable with, it's often said, I wish you would build somewhere else in town. Um, we say it and we know it's, you know, we don't get control over where somebody wants to build their business. But I really wish with all the open land around the city, I live out in the country where I can shoot in my own yard, I really wished, I wish there was a good gun shop and range uh, out in the country near where I live. Uh, I'd have no reservations about it at all. Again, I, obviously, from what I've said, not anti-gun. Um, I have, having spent time at these, some of these uh, facilities, gun shops, um, etc., uh, they can be, the people who walk around outside them and come in um, can be scary. And I'm, you're a courageous man to, to say go away to them. I just wouldn't have, I wouldn't have the, I wouldn't have the, whatever it is, chutzpah to, to, to do that. Um, but if I, I, I can't possibly vote for this, given my knowledge of, of what, what happens around a gun shop, again, not because of the owner, by any stretch of the imagination, and there's no way really to protect against who, and, and also, I lived in the town where the gun owners, gun shop owners were murdered in Kansas City, and you know, that's evidence that it attracts some, it can attract some awful people. Um, there's lots of open land and lots of places where there are no schools for miles out where I live and elsewhere in Douglas County. So if this doesn't work out, I, I hope you don't give up. That's my thought. And so I, I, would, I would have to vote against it, again, but adding that I, I could see supporting something that wasn't near a school. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner Lease. Other comments? I'll just, I think that I pretty much entirely agree with uh, Commissioner Lease's comments. I have less personal experience with gun ranges or gun ownership. Um, I, I see the utility in all of that and I see the utility in a place like this. Um, but anytime we're talking about a rezoning uh, or a significant change in an area and we get neighbors who come out and speak in opposition, I think we need to take that opposition very seriously. Uh, it happens that this isn't really a residential area, it's more an industrial commercial area and the neighbors are a school district and at some point the Boys and Girls Club and, and a couple other businesses that we can see out there. So when we hear that they have serious concerns about safety, um, I think we have to take those very seriously. Um, you know, it's it, in my mind maybe it's an open question as to whether it, it will have any, uh, any significant or verifiable impact on safety out there, but it's also a peace of mind thing for um, people who are sending kids out there, who are taking their kids out there, people who are working um, you know, in the school district or with Boys and Girls Club. It's a peace of mind thing, and I think that's important too. So often we'll have a situation where we're talking about um, <coughs> well, a water tower or a cell phone tower or something like that where it's kind of like not in my backyard but it has to go somewhere. And this really isn't that kind of situation. I understand, again, the utility of these, uh, a, an operation like this, um, but it isn't the kind of thing that needs to be somewhere um, that some neighbors are going to have to put up with the burden of or anything like that. So in a close call like that, um, I really defer to what we've heard from the school board and from the Boys and Girls Club, from other interested members of the community. Um, and, and I think I would agree with Commissioner Lease that um, 
that I would oppose this. And I also take solace from the fact that this will go up to the city commission and uh, they'll, they'll have to take a hard look at it no matter what we do um, after tonight. So I think we're making a very good record for their use and, uh, and a, a good recommendation will come out of this either way. Do you want to reiterate on how we don't make the decision? I know you referred to it, but I mean, we really don't make that decision. Absolutely, and for members of, pub of the public who are here, I'm looking around and I think most of you know how this works, but on some things where the, we can give final approval, and, but on most things what we do is recommend to the governing body, <coughs> either the city commission or the county commission, um, what we think works from a land use perspective. And part of land use is public safety. So we make those kinds of recommendations. And um, if we recommend one way and they, rec and they unanimously vote another way at the governing body, well, then that's what happens. But um, we try and do a good job of teasing out the issues and, and figuring out uh, where the community stands and, and go from there. Um, Scott, did you have something to add? Mr. Chairman, I do not appreciate the discussion, but I think I need to add something to your discussion just so, so you can have the fullest discussion. Um, we, you have before you tonight a rezoning request. We have, I think we're fortunate, and the applicant's fortunate to bring his use to the table. You don't have necessarily a gun range request in front of you. We know that that's, that the zoning is going to accommodate the gun range use, the active rec or the participant sport use. Um, I think it begets a bigger question about whether you think the code is deficient in its treatment of this particular use because we do not have prohibitions in the code for locating this use to schools, um, the, the whole gamut of, of different schools or other types of uses. And so um, while I think you have you know, good cause to make the findings that I that I hear you you leaning toward. It may do, you may want to have a discussion about amending the code or initiating amendment to the code to clarify where gun ranges or, or retail sales mm -hmm. can occur within the city of Lawrence. Because if this were already zoned, we wouldn't be here talking. We'd be going through an administrative site plan um, or even a building permit application and establishing the the use that way. That's an excellent point, Scott. And I also want to mention, I think that staff's recommendation was the appropriate one here. There's, you know, staff has the role of recommending to us how a, an application fits within applicable rules, zoning laws, and that kind of thing. And, and I think that staff's recommendation took all of that into account and made the right recommendation. The reason we have a planning commission and a process that we go through with a public hearing and otherwise is to get you know sort of the extra the extra mile out of that and um, and I think this is one of those situations where we can really see that there is a helpful discussion that goes on outside of just the administrative process. But um, Scott, in terms of in terms of going forward, I mean certainly we could initiate a text amendment um, that would solve this kind of issue going forward, even though I don't think we've really run into it very much. Right. Um, do we need to do anything in particular with this request tonight that would, I mean, it's I, almost I, one of those things where, uh, you know, you might say, oh, well, the zoning makes sense out there, right. but the use doesn't, so we would excise a particular use, which of course wouldn't do any good for Right, and, and that's why, I mean, I'm glad the applicant brought the use because he doesn't want to go through an investment and get approvals and, and time and, and not have it and have it turned down in, in some other fashion. Um, I think what I would recommend is, and I don't know where this, what this outcome is going to be sure. yet, but I think making known in the minutes your opinions about this to the city commission, and then we'll see what the city commission's desire is on this, on this, on this request, and then we'll monitor it and know. I think better after the city commission considers it, if there's a code amendment that might be necessary or clarification in the code that's necessary. Because I think I think you're right, uh, Mr. Chairman, that on its face value, we've done several of these IG to ILs to support some sort of rec use. These buildings typically support gymnasiums, conversions to basketball courts and field houses and those kinds of things. And we see it a lot of times in that context. So that same use that we use for those other types of uses is being used here. 
it just happens to be uh, a gun range and not a basketball court. And so, um, but I do think that it's got a specific context and you are here to consider the public health, safety and welfare, which you're doing through these discussions. And so I think make your opinions known to the city commission is, is a good thing. Appreciate that, Scott. Uh, Commissioner Elise. If it were, though, as you say, that way, and if the school was an issue, if it came up, if the school district raised concerns, mm -hmm. um, at what point would it be questioned? They would, through our administrative site I mean, plan it process. Does it have to be, is there a special process for a gun shop? Not a gun shop, but there is for the site plan review. So we would have gone through an administrative site plan if the zoning permitted it. We would have rendered, and everything, and it met the code, we would have rendered a determination of approval. And then if any stakeholder uh, within 200 feet of our site plan notice wanted to appeal that decision, they could have appealed, they would have the ability to appeal it to the city commission and they would have basically their time in front of the city commission, so. Thank you. Commissioner Denny. This may be a question for uh, our, our legal staff here. Uh, I, I've wrestled with what you talked about, Scott, uh, quite a bit with this issue and, and I keep coming back to our function is kind of, is it, does it fit the code? And that's what we should be voting on, uh, taking into cons into consideration other factors, perhaps. But you brought up the fact about changing the code uh, that might affect uh, gun sales or gun range activities. In with the in, for Randy, the the current Kansas law would it be your initial thought that that might not allow any more restrictive gun laws than the state puts forth? And as, as I recall, that was the last state law that uh, other, other governmental entities can't make uh, gun laws more restrictive than the state already has. That's pretty much the way the new law is written for Kansas, yes. Yeah. So I agree with that. There are certain things that we could do, but we'd be limited maybe to some of it, you know, there, there would be limitations on what the city could do regarding that. Uh, well, Mr. Sure, Sands. Just a point of discussion, but we wouldn't, I mean, the zoning of this doesn't necessarily. Well, it has the effect of law. It's not a, not a law. So if we decide to, as a, as a body, to, to disapprove it, 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 I still don't think it's in violation of the, or, or am I mistaken on where you're going I, with I think, that? I think what Commissioner Denny is saying is if we were to make a text amendment change to our zoning ordinances then, then, and permitted uses, mm -hmm. Not with respect to this particular application, but, but just, just to in gun general. shops in general. Yeah, I right. think that's. Yeah, that's I, 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 my that's my I question would still stand. Then would it really? I mean, it doesn't. It's not necessarily municipal law, even though it's. It has the force of law. We would be able to do some things like we like we do with uh, drinking establishments or um, other types of establishments where we, as long as we didn't do something where it would prohibit it entirely from the city, but you know, you can put certain restrictions on it, on things to limit distances that are reasonable, times, manner, locations, those things all can be done. It's just, it would be a matter of going through and figuring out what, what we could and could not do. I'm not saying we couldn't do anything. There just may be some limitations based on what the state has, has, has done. We'd have to be careful and you'd right. have to do your homework. Yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, whether it's it be a thousand feet, 500 passing. feet, right. something of that nature. Right. Commissioner Lees. Yeah, um, this is more of a procedural generic statement than it is anything to do with, with our decision tonight. You know, there are times when, I, again, we are nothing but a recommending body. Staff recommends something to us. We, sometimes consistent with, sometimes not consistent with staff, recommend something to the city commission. But ultimately, neither they nor we have any choice in anything. Now, when I think our decision is airtight and wonderful and perfect, I wish that we made the final choice, not the city, so that it, the buck could stop here and we could get our way, um, like when we, with AstroTurf, that we didn't think belonged there, and the city turned around. Um, I said I was going to vote against it, but I will sleep better tonight knowing that it really is up to the city commission ultimately. I mean, 
whatever we say, um, it's going to go to the city commission, and that's when, that's when I think it'll really get the hearing it needs because we're talking about these complex matters of um, of whether or not it should even be a permitted use, uh, or whether it should require some kind of special use permit. So, you know, I, I, I'm glad that I'm glad that we'll make a recommendation that they will consider, uh, and it, I, I suspect it'll come back to us one way or the other for for some kind of consideration. I wouldn't be surprised if it didn't, um, but I'd like it to go through them ultimately anyway. Um, Scott, remind us, because there are implications to the way whether we recommend to approve or deny, and it changes the voting requirements for the city commission. Is that correct? To disagree with the to planning disagree, commission. So if, if the city commission takes a view contrary to the planning commission, they have to do it by four out of five votes, mm -hmm. or they can return it to the planning commission for more discussion, and then upon receiving it back again, the city commission by simple majority three out of five votes can do as they wish so there's yeah we are a recommending body of course and but there is a a real impact i suppose procedurally to which way we recommend we don't just sort of yeah commissioner danny question again for procedure <clears throat> if we vote to disapprove or not recommend does it go to the city commission yeah. Uh, yes. Even, even without any effort from the uh, applicant. Okay. So either way, it will go to them. Yeah. Right. yeah. So it's moving on up. Just, just getting that on the record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Von Aachen. Just a point of clarification. A minute ago, you were talking about moving forward, and how pe how anybody within a 200 feet right. radius could protest it. How far is the school district? Well, the, the district is farther away. 750. They, yeah or something it, yeah so the notice procedures for a site plan review is 200 feet plus any neighborhood associations which we don't have i don't believe maybe there's a neighborhood association there to the northeast um but if they saw a sign we also post a sign or if somehow they picked up on the on the application the city commission can also bring the item to up to them and so um we have had in the past up uh uh, stakeholders that don't meet the letter of the notice code ask a commissioner to bring it up on behalf of them and so that's a likely scenario okay but they wouldn't technically have standing in the in the code to to do that a commissioner may though so I'm a little confused about what our options are now then are we to go ahead and state our opinion of the gun range well again we have the benefit of, of having the ultimate use for this rezoning application so I think it's good to consider that that's in the record it's the full record shows that it's to accommodate a gun range use if you find that harmful to the context of its location and want to make that part of your golden criteria review and make a finding and that finding wins the the day in your mind about your decision on this then please articulate that for the minutes and we'll make sure the city commission has that understanding from from each commissioner commissioner sands uh, are we ready to issue our opinions down the down the line i know bruce already gave his but that's, so that's okay. true so have at it all right um so uh, in looking at the golden criteria, I feel like Bruce mm -hmm. invoking the golden criteria. Um, I, think, I, I think it fits many of them. It doesn't obviously fit all of them. The, the use of the, the character of the neighborhood is so disparate that I don't think necessarily that one applies. Uh, we already talked at length about the zoning and the suitability of the property. Uh, <clears throat> To be used under ex and under its existing zoning, we know it's going to require a change. The length of time the property's been vacant has been quite a long time, um, so we land on um, relative gain to public health, safety, and welfare. Um, I'm I'm couldn't be on on more thin of a fence on this. Uh, we, we should base decisions uh, for ourselves on facts and not fears. 
and and I don't know that either the applicant neither the applicant nor those in opposition have well articulated facts over fears if that makes sense um, I think if we tried to amend this or, or if we tried to create a new zoning criteria, new use within certain zonings for this, I think it would unnecessarily restrict the decisions of this body and it would just cause a, a special use or, or change in the zoning anyway. So I'm not sure that, that there's a gain there. Um, as far as safety, public welfare, I think my main concern is, is a negligent, negligent discharge outside of the box. I'm, I have no concerns with what goes on inside that box. Um, I, I don't, Commissioner Lease, I have to disagree. I don't think um, gun ranges or gun shops necessarily draw a certain type of person, especially anymore. I think, I think they're pretty um, diverse. Uh, but by saying diverse, <laughs> by saying diverse, you just contradicted <laughs> yourself. Because diverse means the full range, not one kind of person. Well, I, you're, well okay, good point. I, you're right. If they're uh, diverse. That's my concern. Too. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. yeah okay. All right. I see. <laughs> no, I told you. All right. You so I must. I must. Uh, I. I didn't fully understand your your common sense. So. Uh, Did you say you don't understand my common sense? My wife. No. 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 I. I didn't <laughs> fully understand your comments. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, I, but. But I don't think that it. That it necessarily draws, on average, one type mm -mm. of person I or the other. You. That's. I, that's what I was trying to say. Hundred percent. Half of the fun of going to them is talking to other gun owners. Or half of the <laughs> aggravation of going to them. <laughs> Which um, side are you yeah. on? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> You're confusing me. <laughs> I, I would, uh, wh whichever way this goes, and I don't, I, I would caution the applicant against invoking uh, city agencies or, or state agencies in their opinions of whether or not they think this brings value. Um, I, it's a mis I think it may be a mischaracterization, and uh, I, I just I don't think you ought to do that. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm going to vote four, but it's a very barely four. Okay. And I may be the, I'm sure I may be a voice of dissent in that. We'll see how it goes. Commissioner Von Aachen. Uh, I would like to commend Mr. Sells for um, his objective of training gun owners. I think in this day of um, increased ownership and lax restrictions on that ownership, something we really need is good training so that they know what, how to handle those guns. Um, I also think with, with the with the lax restrictions that we currently have. We just don't know what kind of people are in the school zone anyway all the time. So I think you make a real compelling argument in favor of this. That said, I'm very uncomfortable with endorsing this or voting for it, and I will not support it for that reason. And to invoke the, the golden factor, it would be the, the gain to public health, safety, and welfare um, I, I cannot see that this is a, is a positive. If anything would ever happen over there as a result of our um, supporting this, that would be a, anything to one of the children or to the staff. Um, again, not because of anything you're doing inside, but because of what could happen outside, out of your control. That would be a really difficult thing, I think, for any of us to... Um, to handle. So I will not support this, even though I hope you do find somewhere to do this. I, I, like I said, I applaud what you're trying to do. I just don't think that this close to school property and Boys and Girls Club is the appropriate place. Other comments? Commissioner Struckoff? Uh, um, comments about your objectives and training gun users. Um, I'm very grateful to have had gun training as a child. Um, and I went to a high school with a gun range in the basement. I was on our rifle team uh, in St. Louis, and uh, 
that was a very rewarding experience for me. Uh, teaching respect for the weapon, discipline, concentration, things I believe the uh, shooting instructor thought I needed at the time, uh, and I did. Um, and so um, I do appreciate that, and I want to support you in that way. My concern for this, uh, and the, in the, the one way in, in this that your proposal uh, differs from the range in the community center at Levinson Mass is that that's not a gun store. There's not a retail operation there. And that makes a big difference in my mind. Um, and for the same golden factor invoked by uh, Commissioner Von Ock and the public safety and welfare, um, I will not be supporting this. Commissioner Lease. Yeah, I, a few things. Um, glad that you uh, spoke in support of eff efforts to do this, um, uh, Mr. Sell's efforts. Because um, I, you know, I, for all the reasons earlier said, Rob, I gave you a hard time. I'm really glad that I'm. I'm glad that it's going to be a mixed vo vote. I think I. I don't think the community should necessarily make a statement that nobody on, you know, the planning commission supported uh, a, somebody's rights to open a gun store and an indoor range. So. I'm glad it's going to be a mixed thing. I do want to go back to those golden factors and say what I often say. Uh, our job is to consider them. And you did, but I will always find them to be not only fuzzy, but not weighted, W-E-I-G-H-T-E-D, in any way that makes sense to me, if we're really using it as a metric. OK, the conf conformance with the comprehensive plan, yes. But zoning and use of nearby, pro no, that's not it. Character of the neighborhood, you know, I'm not sure that this is different. It, it's, it's a mixed neighborhood with diversity. <laughs> but um, it, I'm not sure that the character of an educational neighborhood where there are schools and boys and girls clubs, I'm not sure a, a gun range and gun store doesn't dramatically change the character. I don't disagree. I'm saying I don't know. That is part of it's becoming an educational sort of zone area over there. So, so three might also swing me. Um, plans for the area or neighborhood as reflected in adopted area. That's number four on our page 111. I, I, I don't know. It sounds like they're really trying to build a lot of education out there. And I don't know if this is consistent with that. Um, you know, uh, and I don't know how much weight either of those should have or the other ones. Detrimental, detrimentally affecting nearby properties, it could be that somebody was going to build other, other things around there that now they won't build. We don't know. And I'm not disagreeing with anyone, but we're considering the golden factors as we should, but they don't work as well as we wish they did. And, um, so while you guys cited the public health, safety, and welfare, you can look at the other ones and really ask yourself to those. Maybe they apply more than we acknowledged. That's my two cents on the whole use of golden factors. Commissioner Struckoff? I would just like to add for the record for the commission's benefit that uh, this was a very difficult decision for me. Uh, I was really on the fence about this one. I, I really applaud uh, the applicant's efforts, but um, uh, and um, it, it was a very difficult, difficult choice. Commissioner Denny? Well, as was everyone else in looking at the, the golden factors, and, and, and I think that, you know, it, without going through each one of them uh, one by one as others already have I agree with what people have said until I get to number seven and number eight to me it's it it's clearly uh, in keeping with the zoning code to rezone this property uh, with the possible exception of number seven and number eight uh, the effect to de detrimentally affect nearby properties, that being the school district. Uh, I'm unlike some other. I'm not quite as concerned about the, the the teen center because that's from where he said it's going to be well more than a thousand feet away, and I don't know what's magic about a thousand feet, 
Um, Federal law. <laughs> Well, my point is, Which is to say generally when we're talking about zoning, you're talking about a couple of hundred feet or within three or four hundred feet, uh, a block or so. Uh, when we start talking about a thousand feet, you're talking about several blocks. Uh, it's several blocks. Um, it does, number seven, I think, does have uh, some pertinence to, to this this setting, but I'm, I don't think it's enough to, to make me vote against it. Um, number eight, on the other hand, is another uh, public health, safety, and welfare. Um, I think it is somewhat of a public health, safety, and welfare issue to have a gun sales location. Uh, but once again, it's the proximity to the school. I'm not sure that the proximity is really all that close. Um, if it were 50 feet or 75 feet away across the street, I, I would, I think, clearly be saying, no, this is not a good idea. Um, but given that it's not and given the topography of, of, of the area there, um, and that we are, after all, talking about 760 feet from the edge of the property to the edge of the property, um, I'm kind of going to have to be with Commissioner Sands. I, I'm going to, I would be voting for this. It's a thin vote on my side, but I think I would be voting uh, to recommend approval for this. Well, I'll add a couple comments. Um, you know, I already essentially stated my thoughts earlier, but it's always good to hear everyone else's thoughts, and it helps you sharpen your own. Um, I again want to say I think staff made the right recommendation based on um, the the zoning ordinances that they were construing and um, and I think it's really it's for us up here to really w weigh in on some of these public safety issues and I think that's what we're doing tonight. Um, I do want to commend the applicant, Mr. Self, for doing a great job bringing this to our attention um, and uh, answering our questions and and emphasizing the educational aspect of, of what you're trying to do. Um, I, I've been on the Planning Commission long enough that I've started to develop, uh, whether rightly or wrongly, you know, a method to my madness. And one of my methods, I think, is when you have a close call about uh, a new proposed use or rezoning and uh, you've got significant neighborhood opposition, um, I think a lot of the time when that opposition relates to an aesthetic issue, you know, we don't want to see this in our backyard or something of that, to that effect. Um, we don't want, uh, you know, bright lights at night or something like that. Then I think a lot of the time I'll err on the side of allowing a property owner to do what, what they want to and, and can reasonably do with their property um, when it's sort of that aesthetic type of concern. When it's a public safety concern and it's a reasonable one, I think that I've, uh, I, I think I've erred on the side of um, going for public safety and and listening to and following those neighbors and neighborhoods' concerns. So uh, clearly, this is in the latter category where we're talking about public safety. This is a really close call. There's no doubt about it. The minutes will reflect that um, at large. But um, I will vote against recommending approval for this. I also want to just mention for the record that, um, you know, you can see it on the map, but Mary's Lake is right out there. There's a trail that goes right around Mary's Lake that's within that 1,000 foot zone. Um, you know, me and my kids are out there with some frequency walking around and looking down on that intersection. Um, so I think that's something to consider in addition to the uh, educational uses that we've already talked about. Um, lastly, I do think that Perhaps there's an opportunity for some sort of um, look at a text amendment or something so that this could be separated out in the future. Um, I, I'm not sure if we really need to do that because this is probably a very rare occasion um, that we're talking about this kind of thing. But I'd certainly be open to it, and especially if some if concerns are raised at the city commission level that um, you know we want to be able to treat these specific types of requests differently uh, than we'd be. I, I think I, as chair at least, would be happy to entertain that here and, and discuss a potential text amendment. 
but I'm not sure I, I see the use in that um, because the, these instances are so rare. So with that, we don't have a motion, do we? We don't have a motion yet. <laughs> Before we take this out, um, would it be out of order for me to, I don't know if it's a motion or uh, a request, separate from what we decide tonight, I would like staff to look into what other municipalities do, uh, zoning and uh, special use permits uh, for this kind of application. I would like if, if, they, if you guys could do that sure. and put it on the agenda, perhaps for a vote, a text amendment, perhaps not for a text amendment. It could be that we yeah. decide it's not necessary. So if that's... Maybe if, we could talk about that uh, for a potential mid-month topic mm -hmm. or half of a mid-month, depending yeah, on what, depend, what you a, find. Yeah, I mean, it may be that it may be that it's something that we haven't caught up with that's mm -hmm. done everywhere else and then we wouldn't even need a mid-month it would right. be a presentation and a vote or it might be that it's in the middle of the road and we would want to talk about right. it so do you need any kind of vote or anything to be directed to that and no, mr I, chair are you okay with that i, I think that yeah. commissioner lisa i think yeah informally at least we can work with staff and okay. you know they understand that we're not initiating a text amendment right. or anything like that, but just something that we could look at. And I know that um, Vice Chairman Kelly would probably be amenable to looking at that kind of thing in the context of a mid-month too, where we can study it a little bit. And it would be good probably to have some, you know, maybe we need to have some direction out there or some settled approach to this that will give, you know, applicants an idea of what they're gonna run into if, uh, if they wanna do this near a school or, or some similar use so and mid-month meetings are open to everyone there right so it's kind of our study session time where we notice it up <coughs> and anybody can come and we'll talk about stuff like this so we don't have a motion Bruce you've taken us this far okay and I'm going to say it once more um, we are not the deciding body uh, I want the City Commission to take this up and to really listen to uh, Mr. Sells, uh, the applicant, and to listen to uh, the public and to do what they're charged with doing and paid to do, which is to give it a, a, a hearing as a legislative body. So my motion is to disapprove, is that the word? Deny. Recommend <laughs> denial. Recommend <laughs> denial uh, of the rezoning request put before us. Uh, item seven, and I don't see a need to read the whole thing, but, um, and again, I've made the motion and I'll, this, the motion is ended, but it's not because I don't want it to happen, it's because I, I don't, I'd rather see it go to their hands where you get a good, I think you'll get a fair hearing there. So, and especially if the vote is four to two, which it looks like it may be, so. They'll take a hard look at it. They'll take a hard look at it. Yep, we have a motion and a second from Commissioner Von Aachen. Any discussion on the motion? Additional discussion? I think we've done a good job of making our thoughts known. Um, it's a close call for all of us. <coughs> Seeing no additional discussion, all those in favor of recommending denial, raise your hand. We've got four, all those opposed, two. Motion passes to recommend denial, four to two. Well, thank you for those members of the public who are here helping us through that process. Thanks to the applicant. Um, and wish all of you luck at the next round of the City Commission. And community, especially unaffiliated with an organization. Thank mm -hmm. you for coming in. No, well, absolutely. I was just thinking maybe it's, maybe it's break time again. Um, we have several items yet to handle on our agenda so let's go ahead and urinate uh, commissioner lease has specific plans for this break you can ask him about them and let's come back at 9 30. i thought that's what you were thinking <laughs> <laughs> all right we got a bonus five minutes there um let's get back to our agenda Our next item is uh, text amendment, item number eight, text amendment regarding event center uses. Whenever you're ready, Jeff.
Jeff Crick with the City County Planning Office. The item before you this evening is a text amendment to add an event center use to the Land Development Code. Uh, this was initiated by the Planning Commission on August 24th. The reason it was initiated, its use is kind of absent from the code. Currently, we use a variety of different uses to kind of make it work, but the one we use most consistently is deeming an event center a nightclub, which isn't exactly a true kind of term for the, the item itself there since they don't really work in the same functions. Uh, we kind of started by looking at some of the existing centers that you have in the city today. We kind of started breaking them down both in where they're at and how big they are kind of going down the list. 17 current centers exist, 10 of them are found in commercial zoning, five are found in the residential, uh, two are in some other zoning categories. So the kind of, you see those breakdowns, about 35% are showing up in actually the downtown district itself there. So when we looked at this, what we did was we started with the capacity of the centers and began breaking them down based on a couple of different criteria. So we came to two different definitions for it. So the event center small, are less than or equal to 300 occupants in the building, including the staff, and an event center large is greater than 301 occupants. So in your staff reports, you do have some information on the existing centers themselves, some of their capacities. There are three centers currently inside the city limits that can exceed 1,000 people, and there are some that only house 30 people. So the difference range in there runs quite a bit. When we did the analysis, we did not use an average of the occupancy. We used a medium because it gave us a more accurate middle value. We went with the average. The event center large would be somewhere around 500 occupants instead of around 300. 300 is a good, clean break when you look at it, both in terms of the parking and also in terms of the International Fire Code's load factor for the occupancy. And of course, we also, when we did this, we should also mention, we also revised the definition in the code for entertainment and spectator sport to kind of give a very clear separation between that use and the new event center use to kind of break those very cleanly apart. So for parking for an event center small, it was one space for 300 occupants, which works out to be about the same as what you see in a lot of other municipalities. For an event center large, it's one space for every four occupants at maximum occupancy. The reason we chose the maximum occupancy was because typically with an event center, you can have a range of configurations. One of the lowest load factors you can have under the fire code is if there are tables and chairs. So you can obviously see tables and chairs take up quite a bit of space. Some event centers will also let you rent them out without tables and chairs, which becomes a standing room only event, so the fire code rating increases. So the reason we went with the lower occupancy level was both for the parking aspect, but also to control for the total occupancy aspect of each center. Those aspects actually break down into the use tables themselves. <laughs> Event center small and large under the residential zoning district would require a special use permit because those centers do require a little bit more careful handling in terms of parking and just making sure there's adequate ingress, egress, and if there is any outdoor spaces or events, controlling for light, noise, and sound in those instances. Non-residential zoning, so your commercial zoning, some of your industrials, your GPI, your general public zonings, we kind of vary those on the districts by their intensity. Where downtown may be a permitted use, in a more commercial neighborhood setting, we may not want to have that use. We might want to have the regulation and control a special use permit would have in place. So as you look at the use tables that are attached to the text amendment, you'll notice in the commercial zoning, it will vary from permitted to special use based on the intensity of the districts themselves. And of course, with all the information very quickly there for you, we do recommend the approval of the text amendment and forwarding it to the city commission for their consideration. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you very much. There's no applicant. Ms. Davis, do you want to speak on this issue? You're waiting patiently. No, I have to wait for the video. Okay, <laughs> somebody's got it. <laughs> uh, well, let's bring it back to the commission then for discussion, questions. Commissioner Lease. I move hmm. to recommend approval of the revised text for articles 4, 9, 17, and forwarding of the proposed text amendments to Chapter 20, Articles 4, 9, and 17 to the City Commission for the recommendation for approval and adoption. We have a motion and a second. Motion by Commissioner Lee, second by Commissioner Denny. Discussion on the motion? Discussion is thank you. He's right, that is the discussion. This, it does seem like this is a good gap-filling amendment um, yes. that'll nice. be useful going forward, especially as we see these uses proliferating. Um, Scott, did you have anything you wanted to 
Thank you for reading my face, uh, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I do think it'd be helpful just to to have a brief discussion of you know the impacts of these can um, look and and feel a little bit like a like a bar use um, if if there's an act, outdoor activity, patio activity, that kind of thing, even if they're temporary in nature and that sort of thing. So I guess the, the question that I'd like for you to talk about, maybe conclude, is whether the special use permit is the right vehicle or whether allowing them by, by right with use standards, which we had discussed both methods, is a better, more appropriate. And we landed on special use permit because it gave the commission and city commission a, a wider range of context by which to uh, put conditions to and, and review the request and get the notice out to people um, and have a public process. So. Mm -hmm. Seriously, that's, I mean, that's why I said that comment is thank you because obviously there was a lot of thought put into it, so. And I do uh, agree. I think the special use permit is the right way to go about it, especially because the impacts that we're talking about with these kinds of uses are likely going to be sporadic but heavy when they occur, um, especially when you're talking about places that you know might might host a couple hundred person wedding reception that goes late into the evening and things like that. Um, so I think the SUP uh, tool gives us the opportunity to allow these kinds of uses, but to mitigate those impacts appropriately, um, and and to really highlight it for you know the affected neighbors to make sure they're part of that process when it goes through. Something about an SUP seems to get people more in interested or involved um, than just a rezoning or something where it's one of several potential uses. Um, so I think that's the right way to go. Any other? Yeah, I Commissioner a Kelly? question. I noticed um, it's permitted. I think special use permit is the right thing in the residential um, neighborhoods. And I think most in the commercial and industrial look right. Can you give some reasoning behind the GPI designation for a special use permit and how that became special? There are, the one that came to mind is the Lawrence Arts Center, which is owned GPI and can be rented out in a similar capacity. Uh, looking at other locations mm -hmm. kind of in that line there, if there was a center in a similar line, if there was you know, Theater Lawrence was not where it was at, maybe it was in a GPI. Some of those larger space facilities could be rented out and, and meet that. The question then becomes, were they adequately planned for parking and ingress and yeah. egress to the facility? We think the special use permit would help mitigate that. Uh, the other option for some of these would be that if somebody was to buy a, a larger old building, uh, a school or a church, for example, Obviously, those buildings would have capacity issues both inside and outside. The special use permit would give us a range of permissions and a way to cap certain aspects that may not be fitting. So if the building can hold 1,000 but can only park for 100, then special use permit could be restricted in that. And it kind of gives some buildings a bit of a reuse that may not be readily available in certain instances. So the capacity to kind of branch out and I don't want to say to give an, an adaptive reuse, but just allowing the building to have a different range of uses was a consideration there. That's really helpful. Oh, yeah, I hadn't thought about the Lawrence Arts Center as falling in that GPI category. So yeah, that, and I think that would, that is a good one to think about, although it's in downtown. So yeah, I mean, so parking would be, a, be an issue there. Okay, just looking at some of those permitted versus special use permits. Thanks. Other questions or discussion? We have a motion to approve and a second. If there's no further discussion. All those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Unanimously approved. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Bruce. Moving on, item nine is another text amendment regarding personal convenience and personal improvement uses. Is there a downside to doing the final check, the final one for the, so see, I can. Um, we have, so we have. Yeah, I think there's oh. somebody hiding. They're hiding. <laughs> so I wasn't sure. I thought the same thing, Bruce. Um, this one was initiated by a particular. Yeah. I, I didn't notice text anyone else here. Very sneaky. <coughs> I'm 
Whenever you're ready, Sheila. Working on it. Bruce is ready to make his motion. Okay. So. My hands up. He's ready. not ready to make his motion. That's everyone. I move, everyone that, take it. I move that I make the next motion. <laughs> <laughs> Um, tonight you have before you a, a request to amend the development code. Um, the original request was to take the salon spa type use that is similar to barber shops listed in personal convenience and to move that to the personal improvement service um, category and staff looked at a number of different um, codes in the area and came up with a whole range of how um, communities have have treated the salon use and what we determined was that um, we felt it was better to amend personal conveniences than to move it to personal improvement. Um, the difference being that currently convenience services are not allowed in RSO and RMO districts and improvement is. And we have quite a variety of RSO and RMO properties around the city um, most of them are along commercial corridors um, or they're just very small individual um, pieces of property that are scattered. So what we suggested doing is uh, providing a better definition of personal convenience services, um, emphasizing in a small scale setting um, adding, taking out grocery stores and adding convenience there. Um, the hookah retail smoke shop is one of our, where do we put that? And we had already determined that it was similar to these things, so we might as well just say that out loud. Um, also adding some other similar types of convenience uses that weren't specifically um, identified before and then also the other ones that staff has over time determined are similar to these so that we have a better kind of laundry list of what are those typical things we think are convenient services and then in the definition of improvement service what we're doing is adding the language that talks about the group setting which is how Staff has always um, looked at the differences that a uh, personal convenience service is something that you do individually. You go to get your hair cut, pick up your dry cleaning. An improvement service is typically something that's in a group setting like a class or a Weight Watchers meeting space or something like that. So trying to make that distinction a little bit more um, dist different so that they don't overlap quite as much. And then to add a standard so that personal convenience services would be allowed in RSO and RMO, but the standard is similar to other uses that are allowed in RSO and RMO where they're capped at no more than um, a use that occupies 3,000 square feet. And that way it keeps it somewhat limited. You're also limited via parking, not having the external um, drive-throughs and that sort of thing. And in your staff report, you'll see that there are some additional changes to section 510, which you recently um, adopted, which was related to the payday loan um, and all we did was we were looking at that and the architecture of how that was written was not really the same as how we've written the other s standards. So just kind of moving those things around so that they all read the same. So 
We have a recommendation which <coughs> basically affects Articles 4, 5, and 17, the definitions, and um, we've recommended approval, and we hope that you will as well. All right, thank you, Sheila. Uh, as a text amendment, there's no applicant per se. So if there are any members of the public who wish to, there isn't an, uh, make sure I have that right. I mean, I know this was initiated at the request of, right. Um, but certainly this is a public hearing item. Any members of the public who wish to speak, we'd be happy to hear you. She doesn't want to speak. Absolutely, I understand. <gasps> <laughs> then we will close the public hearing. We will bring it back to the commission and a particular commissioner. Unless somebody else wants to knock Bruce off his throne. I have a question. Well then, have at it. Maybe it's just my sheltered life or something, but what is participant or transient habitation? <laughs> what is it? <laughs> participant is part of sports. Well, I don't know. No, well, I, don't, I can read that two ways because there's no comma there. <laughs> the Oxford Page comma is not being used here. What do you think Google is for? <laughs> what is, it's, okay, what is transient habitation? Part, it's participant sports and recreation is, it's sports and recreation participant versus sports and recreation spectator. That's a use in the code. Okay. Um, and transient habitation is the use in the code for lodging facilities such as hotels, motels, bed and breakfast. Who does that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hotels. Yep. <laughs> Gotta love those. That's in personal improvement services. Isn't it? No, no it's excluded. excluded. So participant doesn't go with no. <laughs> oh. Thank I, you. I'm, Thank you. It's, I'm gonna. It's, in, it's inside the quotation marks. Yeah. I am gonna ask that Bruce move to initiate a text oh, amendment dude. for the transient, Grand the slam, participant transient habitation <laughs> use. I thought it was habituation. We'll like work on a definition. <laughs> I move to recommend approval of the revised text for articles four, five, seventeen, and forwarding of the proposed text amendments to chapter 20 articles 4 5 and 17 to the city commission with a recommendation for approval and adoption we have a motion and i'll second wait commissioner von Oppen. oh that's fine no i'll second this one i guess Bobby. Uh, a motion and a second to recommend approval and adoption of the text amendment any discussion further discussion questions Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Motion approved unanimously. Okay. I do have a question about it. Grocery was removed from the, from the language. Where does it go now? It is already in food and beverage retail sales. Okay, and the other question is, uh, when, when you were talking about yoga studios and meditation, what about something like the Silverback Group? They're doing the, the uh, is that participant recreation or sports or something? You know, they were doing the uh, group exercise stuff uh, oh. over on 19th Street in the old mm -hmm. Zimmerman, right? Fitness. Yeah, that's um, either active recreation okay. or participant What's sports and recreation. Recruitment? Okay. Smoking a hookah. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's in right. personal convenience. Convenience, okay. Convenience. Speaking of, you had me going there for a second. Speaking of personal improvement, item ten is the text amendment <laughs> relating to parking and access. Oh. Oh. Aren't you aren't you done? Done? That's a good segue. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> which we have seen portions of before in various iterations, and we've worked on it, and it's back now with Sheila, its careful steward. Okay, so if I move to Elmo, is this gonna take over? Elmo. Oh. No. You see this picture that I took from the top of the hill next to the school district project? You took it? Yeah. Is that the guy's child? It's right there. Yeah. 
What in the world is going on? When did you take it? Uh, just shortly after the sermon. 31st of May. That's from the hillside. Yeah, yeah, I recognize it. Okay. Yeah. You have in your packet the summary memo that we prepared for you in August and it was too late in the evening for you to discuss it. So um, you have for 908 This is a summary of what I think the commission arrived at, the majority of the commission arrived at, related to parking large vehicles like recreational vehicles, where we have basically the weight limit that looked at, if you remember, I had my little pictures of the different trucks, and so basically just the classes that would be um, a regular kind of pickup truck, a four-door pickup truck fits into that, and lighter on one end of the spectrum, and then the things that are much larger than that, like big dump truck or an RV or that sort of thing, were on the other end. And, um, Except, don't let me put the RVs in there. Sorry, never mind. So it talks about what you can park on a residential property so that we have some good guidelines for um, not allowing those big pickup trucks, um, the dump trucks and the big over the road kind of trucks on a residential property in the city. And then we have special language that identifies what we mean when we talk about generally RVs, but they include lots of other recreational vehicles. So we're defining all of that. Then what we did is took all of the discussion that you had in many, many months and put that into a table of where can you park and where can you not park those different types of recreational um, equipment. And then we have a separate one that deals with trailers. So we talked about we want it to be safe and we want it to be on a hard surface and we want it to be screened if it's on an exterior um, side yard. So we set up the, the statement that they could be parked in the front of a house as long as they're at least 18 feet from the curb line which would be a relatively easy way for staff to administer that. And then we set up the um, situations where you could park in the side yard or um, in the rear yard if you had a detached garage or an alley. Um, and that you can park it inside a structure if you have room to build that structure on the on the property. Um, then there's a separate table that talks about where you can park um, utility trailers and those commercial trucks. Um, basically, the truck can only be parked if it's in an enclosed structure. Uh, trying to make that 
very clear in the code and um, the consensus the last time we talked was that utility trailers could not be parked between a house and the street and that they could be in a side or rear yard as long as um, they didn't have equipment on them. If you had equipment on it, you could park it inside of a structure. So if you had a lawn mowing business and you had trailers, but you had a detached garage to park that in, that would be fine. You didn't need to load and unload. But again, um, one of the things that we wanted some um, feedback on was whether having these kinds of tables is helpful. Um, and I apologize for not being as tuned in as I probably should be because I haven't read this section in a while. So um, we also had the additional standards that we had talked about in terms of limiting total numbers and we have some limitations that had been in the previous code that we wanted to make sure we got put back in where you can't live in the RV on the property um, and trying to set up something um, to deal a little bit with the maintenance issues so that everyone's like, yeah, I don't mind it if it looks nice and it's well kept, but, and so having some language that allows our code enforcement folks to be able to go out and address some of those things. So that, in a nutshell, was about a year's worth of discussion off and on on RVs. And um, if you have feedback, that would be great. And if you want to mull it, you can certainly mull it um, over. Um, <laughs> mull it over. Um, and then the, the rest of what I have is relatively new it's introducing to you some of the changes that we wanted to make to clarify um, driveways and parking configurations specifically for vehicles for for passenger vehicles um, in different locations and that that section um, or that change really encompasses two sections which makes it kind of messy trying to show you what we're doing because section 908 is location and 915 is driveways and access and so there were some things that were originally in 908 that seemed more appropriate to the driveway category and vice versa so there's some mixing and matching there plus the big part on that is um, consistency with chapter 16 of the city code, which actually creates those standards for single family and duplex driveways. And also the biggie that the Board of Zoning Appeals has had to deal with for nine years is the fact that when we adopted the code in 2006, we set a standard of going that you had to have 200 feet of frontage before you could have a second curb cut like a circle drive on your single family house and we found that that was pretty burdensome there are not very many properties that actually have 200 feet of frontage the um, largest district basically has a hundred foot um, requirement in terms of width and so that 200 foot was very onerous and we've had many requests that have had to go to the Board of Zoning Appeals where it probably made sense to allow a circle <coughs> drive um, but we didn't have that ability um, it had previously been a hundred feet and it's a hundred feet in chapter 16 um, the Public Works chapter so we wanted to bring that back for consistency's sake so 
Those are some of the changes that are in 908 and 915. And Candace is here. Um, she has sent a letter from Lan about duplex um, parking specifically. And one of the changes that we incorporated are these sketches that are a posted planning director interpretation that we have been operating under for several months, um, several months, several years, um, that basically there is a part of the code that says that single family and duplex driveway or single family and duplexes can have all their parking in their required driveway. And so you could have a single car, single family home or a duplex with a single car garage and have one space in the garage and one space directly behind it in the driveway. Um, that works pretty well in some situations when we have four bedroom duplexes and you have a double garage and two parking spaces in the driveway and you have four separate occupants, sometimes not so well. Um, and then when you add in alley parking and um, having a tray with a garage set back um, has created some, some difficulties in some of those older parts of town. Um, I do know, and I think Brian can probably um, weigh in on this, that the Orea Design Guidelines Committee has recently talked a little bit about um, having that stacked parking, whether they are going to address that in the guidelines off of alleys. So, um, so anyway, as a starting point, we put, we just pulled those interpretation sketches in. Mm -hmm. These would be the not approved kind where you double stack or you have a driveway and an alley tray. Um, as a starting point for discussion and we expect that You'll probably talk about it at a future mid-month, if that's your desire. Or you can just give us direction tonight and we'll move on. So, okay. I think that's all I have to say on this stimulating topic. I don't think we'll let you get away with saying only that. Um, but thank you, Sheila, and we will open it up to members of the public if there are any. Thanks for staying, uh, staying with us well, through a long I, I agenda. I do have endurance, <laughs> <laughs> even though I'm tired. So it's uh, Candace Davis, and I am representing land tonight that is the Lawrence Association of Neighborhoods. Um, I wanted to let you know that there are approximately 45 neighborhoods in the city at our land meetings, we have, I would say, 16 to 18 active neighborhoods that c come to meetings once a month. Um, what our concern is, and I, I sent you that letter, we've been uh, in, uh, alerted to this problem for, gosh, it, more than two years. And in the Oriad neighborhood, we definitely were seeing um, uh, issues with this. So I guess our, our um, basic uh, perspective is that this is an outdated uh, code it needs to be looked at and it may have been that at some point in time in the past duplexes um, served a purpose for families they generally were two bedrooms on either side but what we have begun to see and there are a number of neighborhoods right now that are having problems North Lawrence Sunset Hill Oriad East Lawrence Pinckney um, with these excessively large 
duplexes. So what we are seeing is that there have been, there's motivation to build uh, duplexes that have four bedrooms on either side. And the advantage is that you can add density without providing the parking. So um, they're allowed to have stacked parking. And this is the only um, multiple dwelling unit that I'm aware of, and Scott can correct me, that allows stacked parking. And I can understand, as Sheila mentioned, um, a house, you know, with a driveway. And logically, it's usually a family. I, I guess it can be renters, too, sometimes. But um, what's happening is that with these four bedrooms duplexes, which then make eight bedrooms on one property in multifamily zoned areas. In single family zoned areas, you get as many as three bedrooms on either side. But what happens is that they're not using those garages. They cannot get out. They can't have access to the streets. So there's an incredible spillage onto the um, public parking spaces in the streets. Um, and frankly, I, I think that um, is destructive to the historic uh, homes. I think it degrades the livability of neighborhoods. And um, I think it's a problem for tenants and homeowners as well when they don't have access to even allow their guests or friends to find parking on the street. So I, I just feel like um, these huge duplexes do a disservice and um, they're actually impeding sometimes emergency vehicles by crowding the streets. And um, so what I'm saying, it's a problem. I think the stack parking is a problem. I think it's being misused in order to uh, promote financial gain, but at a disservice to the neighborhoods. Uh, and I think it's dangerous for kids on bikes, walking, to have that many cars, you know, necessarily spilling onto the street. So um, if you have a rental property, I think you need to provide parking, which is one space per bedroom, no stack parking. So I, it's confusing. I, I know, I don't know if we'd have as many objections if it, the duplexes remained at two. Uh, bedrooms on either side but when you get to this four there really aren't families anymore these are um, adults so you have eight adults essentially living in these two units um, with cars and before the duplexes with two bedrooms used to be a family generally not everyone in the family was driving because they would be children under age um, you know, so some of it makes sense if it's family to have stacked parking, but when it's not, uh, this to me is a small apartment complex, and it's not um, designed, as I would say, duplexes are intended to be transitional, low density. So that's all I have to say. I hope you'll think about this and give it some very serious consideration. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Well, we'll bring it up, uh, back up to the commission for discussion. Oh. So, so what I'm really looking for is to initiate an amendment for duplex parking. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Uh, bring it back to the commission for discussion. Questions of staff or otherwise? Commissioner Von Aachen. As I look at this table on the second or third page in from this, you know, with the yes, no parking, we worked all those months and all we came up with was yes, 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 yes. <laughs> and the bottom one's no, 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 no. Really? That's what we came up with? I remembered all sorts of yes, no's and things. I think I can. You get a lot more separation of vehicle types Initial. in our in our spreadsheets, our working spreadsheets. I think that may be one thing you're looking at. And then we had, yeah, had some different condition notes and things like that. 
I just didn't remember us being so permissive with on the, in, in that top graph where we allowed all of those things. I'm not saying we didn't. I'm just saying I was surprised to see this because I thought we just, you know, really delineated between front yard, backyard. <laughs> I was rather surprised when I put it all together in August as well. <laughs> Commissioner Von Aachen, is it, it, I want to make sure that I understand because I, I initially had some of the same response Although I think when we're looking at, like, if you're talking about the, the table at the top of page 145, uh -huh. which relates to passenger cars, trucks, right. and motorcycles, um, I think, I, I don't remember us having a lot of discussion of prohibiting passenger trucks, cars, and motorcycles. No. And but then you get down the to the commercial stuff and utility trailers. Well, and the recreational vehicles and the boats. Right. I think that's where I remember <laughs> us initially starting off with lots of different okay yes if these conditions no if these mm -hmm. and but then change it this way and then i think at some point after a couple meetings we had come back we started to realize well if we're going to allow it here we ought to allow it here and we started to sort of simplify our approach a little bit and it's yeah. been a while so this is fuzzy for mm -hmm. me too but but i do remember starting off with it feeling very complicated and then getting to a point where we seemed to have some you know, we weren't all unanimous on things, but we, we there seemed to be some simplification of approach. Um, and I think we've separated them out, so you do see so quite that, a bit of prohibitions on that lower table when it comes right. to yes. trailers. And, and again, vehicles. I'm not saying this isn't what we mm -hmm. came up with. I'm yes. just saying I was so surprised to see it. Right, right. Commissioner Denny. Oh, sorry. I was going to say thanks. She looks like a very complicated thing. Yeah. Very concisely putting it together. And, and I think... Uh, Commissioner Von Aachen, when you look at the tables, there's lots of things in those tables. We were just working with them in a loose, large, flowing form. She's done an excellent job of putting this together in a very easy to understand and makes it look simple when it's really not. You know, uh, if, if I may, yeah. Eudora is doing the same thing. Oh. <laughs> and so now, Kurt and I both come home from meetings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Pulling our hair about this. <laughs> maybe they'll loan. Maybe uh, Scott yeah. will loan Sheila too. <laughs> I don't think he's going to loan me until I finish this one. <laughs> My recollection too was at one of our most recent meetings in discussing it was a talk about enforcement, and, and you know we had so many weird versions mm -hmm. of that, mm -hmm. and wanting to bring it down to a way that we felt staff could actually enforce it you know there were some things on that. there that we thought were not actually enforceable and would make it difficult for staff so i think this does a nice job of of making it clear enough to the public of what our intentions are without overstepping i think and controlling too much that's where i sort of felt like it was going was boy it, it, to wade through the the requirements and the you know for this it's this and this and, and this simpler version I think sort of we talked about it being a first step you know and, and making mm -hmm. sure and not going too far down the road of remember we were we had different classes and different types of vehicles and, and all yeah. that and wanting to simplify that a little bit so this is what I remember I will say that I think we need a lot more time with the whole um, driveway and parking as I was going through that I was like wow I I don't feel like I've spent any time dating right. this girl so I, you know <laughs> <laughs> I don't know anything about that and so uh, you know I, I, I feel really comfortable with the um, motorized vehicle non motorized vehicle I still and we've had a hundred discussions about it it seems like this whole utility trailer issue I'm still not totally there and I probably won't be about whether there's equipment in it or not and where that happens and where it does not but I may never be comfortable with that so mm -hmm. Commissioner Denny uh, it, it is pretty much the way I remember it too really uh, the uh, but one thing I don't remember and perhaps someone can refresh me did any discussion about only one vehicle with a business name or commercial vet message being able to be parked in a driveway did we 
how did did we come up with a number one or did you kind of put that out as a is that something we really talked about I think in general we maybe talked about it but I don't think we we didn't decide on on one that's what I recall point point me to the right place uh, I don't know how to tell what page number page 145 yeah no that's another thing that's that's the table it's the next 146, page. 146, yeah. Letter F. Uh-huh. And, and if I'm duplicating effort here, please somebody shut me off, but I think we should probably talk about that a little bit. One with a commercial message or business name on it in a driveway. And I, probably there's not too many people that fit this, but where the, the, the the two working people in the household both have a company car that have a, a name on it. That's, uh, I would hate to see us say that they can't do that. Uh, but I'm open for discussion here. So uh, Sheila is one way to go about this tonight at least to, to just circle a couple things like that that mm -hmm. we want to discuss next time we sure. talk about it. So let's make a note of that one to, to have that on our agenda. Um, you mean we don't need a motion? Let's say, uh, is, are we through with motions for the night? Uh, well, I'm sure Bruce will get his chance. Yeah, no. <laughs> Bruce, can, Bruce can move to, yeah. Uh, I'll just move. We'll we'll just move. move. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have a similar question to the one Commissioner Denny just asked, but it's related to watercraft boats and trailers parking in the front, and we have yes if 18 feet from the curb. And I just don't remember... For some reason, I had in my head that we, w we had some limitation, or maybe it's just the 18 foot that I'm thinking of. Maybe this we is separated one. separated out utility trailers from those kinds of trailers maybe that's and talked it about is. it might be okay for those, but utility trailers was the big push in the discussion yeah. that I remember. And I and think I some of the discussion was, well, you could have, it, okay, well, you can have an RV parked there, so the RV might be a bigger box than yeah, the boat. Know. So it was one of those where originally it was a no, but yeah. then when you compared it to the other things you were permitting, you were like, well, then I guess we should. And it also, I think I'm remembering now, thinking that it should be okay for a limited time at least, but then you get into how do you... How are you going to enforce it and say, well, it's been there for six days instead of five or whatever? Because it. I remember a conversation we had about the purpose of the change to begin with. Was it aesthetics? Do you remember that conversation versus safety? And when we started getting into boat heights and RV heights and all those types of things, it felt like we were starting to go down the road of a little bit of, well, that's a pretty boat and that's an ugly trailer. And that's where I feel like we stepped back to, it's about safety, it's about those types of things. That's just what I recollect. I don't know if anybody else remembers that. Or maybe I just dreamed that in another I dream about parking. It. Yeah. It. Yeah. <coughs> Commissioner Stark. There's something I, I'd like to see circle, and that is <coughs> under the, uh, the, the smaller, the second of the small tables, uh, commercial trucks and utility trailers. I'm on page 141 on my I get the sense I, that that's not 141 for everybody else, but anyway. 145. Uh, Wait, it's 141, is it? You Mac okay. guys are different. Oh, yep, we might be different. Are... <laughs> uh, no, I got 141. 141. <coughs> um, it says uh, that utility trailers may be parked in the side yard without equipment stored on them. Uh, and same for the rear yard. Um, and earlier tonight someone mentioned the person with the lawn mowing business and if you've seen a lawn mowing business trailer he's got two or three riding mowers on there and five weed whackers and whatever else um, I'm wondering if it might be reasonable to have that stuff left on the trailer but screened it can have it can be on the trailer with screening I thought screening was pretty clearly six foot high fencing or view reducing shrubs. Oh, that kind of screen. I thought you meant yeah. on the trailer. Oh, no, no. <laughs> like screening. I thought you meant like you got to have 
like a net. A scrim, <laughs> like on the, on the stage, yeah. <laughs> covering it up. That's a good one to note for um, discussion. I, I'm thinking about just obviously he doesn't park in the side yard, but if that's where he needs to park, or <clears> you know. <throat> Can he do that without unloading the trailer? That's, that's a, from a practical consideration. This person gets home at the end of the day. Do they have to, if they park on the side of their house, do they have to unload their entire trailer? And where do they put that stuff? I mean, that gets back to the question of, you know, where are you going to put the, where, you, where were you planning on putting it when you bought all this stuff? But mm -hmm. that's, a, that's a separate question, you know, that's which also addresses the stack parking and why are you putting a boat in the driveway when you could leave it at the marina? But you know. at that point, where you're talking about the laundry, that to me then becomes a commercial trailer, not a not a utility trailer. Um, that that's true. Um, if it's used, if it's used in your business, I see what you're saying. It's yeah. a commercial trailer. Yep. I'm, I'm sure we probably mashed that over once before, and I'm just well, no, we haven't. <laughs> no. Yeah, d is that if you look at the reflected in? Yeah, if you look at the definition just above that table, you'll see utility trailers include for personal or business use. Ah, okay, so it's whatever you call it, it's the yeah, same so there, rule applies. I think there are some home occupations where the, you might have some trailers with mm -hmm. equipment on it. So, well, so I'm thinking of the practical limitations of somebody coming home and doing unloading a trailer if they park on the side. Again, you know, before that, you might say, well, maybe you don't park on the side of your house. But mm -hmm. So to make sure that this is that this is an issue that should be discussed, um, I'm looking at that that definition of, for utility trailers and commercial vehicles, Scott or mm -hmm. Sheila, and it doesn't would a would a trailer that is not motorized but it's a trailer on which you have business equipment be a commercial vehicle or commercial truck or would it be a utility trailer? Utility trailer. Okay. okay. So the lawn business trailer with the multiple mowers and weed whackers on it would be under utility trailer. So it's still a utility trailer. Yeah. Okay. And that so is one of our more common yeah. code enforcement complaints. Okay. The trailer with a bunch of um, landscape debris equipment mm -hmm. on it. And it's usually in the, parked in the front of the garage. And, do they distinguish but here we're saying between we debris can't versus equipment? Uh, it may be a nice clarification, you know, yes without anything on it versus yeah. spelling out all the different things you could put on a trailer. Commissioner Sands? Uh, it would seem to me that this, that would also restrict uh, any remodeling businesses from having their equipment because they're non-residents of the, of the property parking their trailer vicinity of the job site. It's a commercial trailer. That's I think there's an exception in Was there? Yeah. Did I miss it? That's Can't remember where it is. Oh, it's weight limit 2C, is that where? Normal and reasonable, commercial motor vehicles and trailers that are making normal and reasonable service calls at the okay. property are exempt, exempt mm -hmm. from this provision. Does that exempt them from the tables below and all that too? Oh, yeah. So, yeah, that's yes. a good, <coughs> a good question, but I think it is answered that. there. Mm. Mm -hmm. Finally, catching up with what people are saying, without equipment stored on there, so you can't store equipment on your. But what about leaves and boxes and yeah. You can because could you store debris? Yeah, could you store debris? Could you store and, junk? And and to me, it's more important not to not to store debris on it than <laughs> it is to not store the lawnmowers on it. Right. So, gotcha, right. Commissioner but Kelly. I hate to say it's this, but late. one man's junk is another man's treasure. I mean, I, which is why or, you say, or a neighbor which kid's is why treasure. you say nothing. I, I mean, I think remember in the urban ag we had that issue well, as but well. But this doesn't even say nothing. It says. Without oh, equipment. I understand where you're going now. You, you, yeah. Right and now, it allows it. Right, yeah. right now, it allows it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so fine. maybe it should not. Yeah. Well, I'm with Commissioner Denny. I think we should restrict this these uses as much as possible. I can't believe I'm saying this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but well, I, I do want to, at some point, remake my objection about no parking in the front at all. But that's okay. Yeah. Well, let's <clears throat> let's talk about utility trailers with or without equipment with or without debris. Um, 
when we take this up because I think there is I think we can dig down a little bit on that because I'm a little bit not entirely satisfied with the way that it is right now either I don't I don't think most of us are um, any yeah. other issues we've spotted here in terms of at least in terms of the parking we've already done yeah Commissioner Cole you know, I, I appreciate the definitions uh, and I think those are pretty thorough. I, I'd recommend all of us go back and kind of read in those in detail. But I, at first glance, I, I appreciated the, the detail and depth of those definitions. That helped me understand. Yeah. And if somebody trying to, to use this as a guide, I think those definitions would be pretty self-explanatory. Commissioner Kelly, I, I would circle that weight limit C. <laughs> To make sure, I think Commissioner Sands is right on. That seems sort of buried if the intention is that we would allow service vehicles, you know, the construction company that stops at the house, where it is in the weight limit, that doesn't, I don't, that seems buried a little bit. I already said that, didn't I? You did? Yeah. I agree. You highlighted the fact that it seems Thank you. buried. Thank nice, you. Nice <laughs> save there, buddy. Uh, I think we need to put that out up front as an item in itself that if, if someone is in the process of delivering a service but I, I also think that there may need to be some time limits imposed I'm just trying to think of a situation where it seems like there's been a construction truck in front of or trailer in front of a home for an extended period of time well I think so it's, maybe that's just to circle that letter C and have yeah. a further discussion yeah that, that may be the way it says it. normal and reasonable service calls the way maybe it that's is, but, fine but yeah. but I agree that it probably needs to be set out as a sort of an independent exclusion from all these mm -hmm. um, I can see a situation where a, a longer term construction project might have a trailer sitting there for an indeterminate Amount of time, so put it if you put a limit on that, that that might be problematic. You know, if it's a week, you know, if you say 48 hours is what, what like the street parking rule or something like that, but that's too short, I think. So. If you want to do like a multi year build the palace at Versailles in your backyard exactly. thing, then you're just going to have to pay the fines because that's not <laughs> that's not normal and reasonable. Uh, there are limitations to how long a permit is good for. Yeah, that, that's not being worked on. So. Yeah, okay. I think that so all that's where we should maybe tie it to the permit. Permit yeah. and tie. Okay. Well, yeah. Let's circle that one. Probably a, a quick. Would fix be there. would it be the same thing for permitting with debris then? If you're removing construction debris or excessive yard waste debris, I guess you wouldn't really need a permit yeah, for yeah. excessive for removing debris. And I, I think if they're removing debris through a something on wheels that should be a daily or you know to put that utility trailer in front and stack debris on it right I, but it at some point they need to rent the dumpster which is very cost effective in our community maybe too cost effective to put that dumpster in the front and then that has a different role. okay so we've got i think three things for discussion on this any other are we going to have further flying. discussion on the, on the parking? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The, the driveway parking and yes. the duplex parking. Mm -hmm. and we haven't even got things because I've got to confess I don't understand those. <laughs> right, that's why I think we need to spend some time with that. Sheila will Just bring her matchbox car. Yeah, she'll do, general. do your magic on it. Yes, they're in my office. Thank you. <laughs> I love them. Um, well, it, if there's no other discussion or issues to highlight on the parking stuff that we've already seen in terms of utility trailers and commercial vehicles and all that. Um, anything that jumped out to people in terms of other parking, duplex parking? Yes. Oh, yeah. Can I, can I just, um, to Candace's kind of request to initiate an amendment on duplex parking, there's no need to initiate it. We have okay. this amendment going. This is a comprehensive can review, in? so we can roll that in. Okay. Seems like it. Commissioner Von Aachen. Well, I was just going to echo what who was it, Commissioner Denny said about being a little confused about this parking. And um, yeah, I, I I would just like a little more specifics. I know you, what you're objecting to is stacked parking, but um, in duplexes, right? 
just duplexes. Ms. Davis, could you come up just so we, people are gonna to wanna to listen to what you. It's, it's, be, it's become a trend instead of modest sized duplexes to build these very large ones because they can provide 50% more density without providing for parking. Okay, so, my, my questions are a little more mundane than that. Could oh. you bring that page down a little bit? On the Elmo, oh, me? Yes. Oh, bring it down here. So you can this way. Well, take it up, I guess. Oh. So, oh, 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 oh leave oh, it there. Oh, sorry. Oh. We just, I just want to see those diagrams at the top of the page. Okay. Okay. For example, on the upper right, or the middle right, that's um, the four square one. Yes. I can't say that I understand. So let me try to simplify. So okay. detached dwelling, single family and duplex allow parking in the driveway in a stacked fashion, one behind the other, just like you would at your home. Um, after that, triplex and above requires compliance with the parking lot design standards which doesn't have a stacked accommodation so you can't stack it you have to build drive lanes in and 90 degree parking or one-way parking or something like that so that's typically out in front of a home right you're coming off a street into a driveway what we were tasked with by a applicant question is okay if we have an alley what can we get by way what how far can we stack up uh, on, off an alley? And so for that question, we came up, what we did was we looked at the code and we said, well, the intent, the value of the code is for detached and duplex, where we kind of draw the line, we say those sort of act as single family homes, both the single family home and the duplex. And they're designed usually with split driveways and they're sort of a driveway design versus a parking lot design. You don't want parking lot designs for duplexes because it takes away from the residential characteristic of the area in, in, in one's uh -huh. view. So what we came up with are some diagrams to help us under, help us and designers design parking scenarios off of alleys. And we use the basic tenets of the code that says, well, you're either gonna have a residential feel if you stack kind of vertically back your lot or if you do horizontally across the alley with a tray of parking. And then we came up with a, a balance basically that says um, like that on the left kind of middle one there, right. that if you do some amount of stacking, maybe too deep, and then a tray of parking across the alley, that may be keeping within residential appearance and characteristic. But anything past that doesn't keep within that characteristic. So if you have that garage in the middle left, and then the parking place behind it is so you've got two deep but right. one's inside is that still considered stacking yes yes okay yes so that's that would would, and that would be per, that's permitted right now off an alley scenario not so this isn't in front of a yard with a street yes right because driveways have certain width requirements they can only get maximum width so um, that that was sort of our approach anyway when we did this interpretation of the code so what we're trying to do is formalize the interpretation. We are looking at the Oriate design guidelines. I think we're maybe a little bit more strict than what these diagrams are. So yeah. I think what, what, at a minimum, we need to match up the Oriad guidelines in, in this Article 9. So is what Oriad would prefer would be to do away with even the middle left one where you have one car in the garage and one car behind it? Well, we're finding that nobody's using the garage. Uh -huh. It's either um, because you because these are adults, they're not families, and they're needing to get their cars out. So they're not using the garage. A lot of the garages are just party rooms or rooms to use to collect things or store things. So it, it's just that it's morphing into something else. And I think uh, Scott has mentioned, you know, duplexes were with the idea in mind that it's family-like, but it's become something different. Right. 
And then what is happening in not just our neighborhood now is that they're um, putting excessive cars on the street in the public spaces. And it's becoming a problem in other neighborhoods too. And it's these large size. I think people probably wouldn't be paying as much attention if it was just the two bedrooms on either side. So anyway, that's, yeah, and I, I'd have to say I, I don't exactly understand the drawing, sorry, Sheila, but. So I, I mean, it's, I'm sure it's very confusing, but it's just that bumper to bumper parking that, I mean, who wants to be the first one in? You want to wake up your roommates and tell them to move their cars, or you have to seal their keys and do it yourself? Uh, yeah. And you're concerned about this, whether it's off the alley or whether it's off the street? Is that Either correct? way. Either, Either way, way it not, becomes an talking. issue. Yeah. Right, okay. right. Um, yeah, Commissioner Culver. Yeah, just uh, in terms of the Oriad design guidelines, we have tried to tackle some of this. And it, it, it's obviously something that will we'll go to the neighborhoods and come back to Planning Commission, and we'll have our public <laughs> hearings. But I, I do think it's important that we try to be consistent amongst the two um, so that for a lot of reasons, especially enforcement as we go forward, that we have some consistency. And I'd say the discussions that we've had, if you look at these diagrams, and it may be worthwhile, Sheila, that we get the Matchbox cars out and, and try to, at a mid-month or at another meeting, try to visualize how this might look. But you look at figures one, where you have a, a garage and then behind that a tray of parking. That's something that we didn't think would fit with Oriad. Same with figure four, where you have a garage and then two stacks behind that. And then figure five also was something that we didn't think would be fitting where you just have the, the stack parking with the four, but figures two and three with just a tray, no carport, that one in the upper right, and possibly the garage with the tray behind it on on figure two um, you know that's all something that, that we'll want to discuss and look at but I, I think it's about finding a balance within this um, as to protecting the different stakeholders involved mm -hmm. and it, it's tricky because I don't think there is a, an absolute right it, it is finding that balance and trying to eliminate the ones that really are on extremely unwanted but also providing some adequate parking um, and also trying to keep within the character of the neighborhoods and residential areas. So is there anything to add to that at this That's point? Good. So in terms of process, um, do we need to wait for that ORIA design guidelines process to play out, including with us or? I think I, my preference is to kind of Messily go forward with both of them and so, see, and then and then see what kind of happens at the end. Yeah, later. I don't think they're too far off. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I agree. Especially since I think most of, well, at least a lot of the work that we've done now so far, I'd hate to let it sit. Um, okay. So we need to basically set this for another mid month. Is that that where we are? Were there any other particular issues or concerns that commissioners had that we wanted to identify before we, not that we need to solve right now, but just to issue spot? Uh, I guess I, I thought perhaps it would be wise to state our intent with these, with this new language that is identify the problems precisely and then be clear about what we're hoping to achieve. Um, when I think about the issue of stack parking, <clears throat> I'm looking at a house here, it's a three bedroom house on my way to work every day. There are four cars in the driveway. They have a one car garage. They have three bedrooms and four cars out front. One of them is constantly being worked on. It's a very nice mid 80s Chevrolet pickup truck. It's a beautiful thing, but it takes up a ton of space and these people are always on the sidewalk with at least two of their cars. So it, there's the issue of, 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 of front, uh, driveways, the issue of, of rear driveways and stacked parking, which is creating more, a lot more cars, and when that's full, it's spilling out into the public right of way, and that to me is a is a, is a big issue. 
is, is the dependence, it, it is, it's motivating. Uh, you, you use the word, Kenneth used the word motivation. It's um, encouraging people to depend on the public right of way to store their car full time. And I, that's, that's a problem in our city, uh, both from an institutional and, and private development standpoint. Um, so there are a lot of facets to this, three important ones right there that I can think of. And I guess, do we want to identify the, the, the um, encroachment of private autos into the public right of way as a problem? Do we want to identify the blocking of sidewalks or um, just the sheer number of cars and the size of duplexes? I, I visited a friend of mine in the 900 block of Missouri a few weeks ago. And next to her, there's a new house, new, I don't know if it's duplex or what, but it's, it's maybe 920-ish, a very, very large. Is that the one where they found the explosive device? Okay, <clears throat> it's, I couldn't believe how big that thing is. It's, it's, it's incredibly large. I, are you familiar with this? With the yeah, I think, I think that was the, the house they were gonna tear down. So, and this is exactly one of the reasons. So. The motivation was he could make that a duplex and get the density he wanted, and then he extended the back of that house so it's enormous, but he's really not providing the parking for the numbers of individuals that are going to live in that house, which to me is a burden to the neighborhood. I think it's unfair to other folks who have to abide by a parking standard that makes sense. So there's been uh, an effort because it's in, an incentive to make more money um, and if you're an investor you don't live in the neighborhood you're gonna do you know take advantage of it so to me it's just the way sometimes these things I, I would say maybe there are loopholes but there are ways that they morph into something that really wasn't the original intention I guess my my, I guess my wish was that is that we explicitly identify these issues and our, our institutional wish to address them and solve them and identify them as such. And are you saying in, in the context of having that in, in, as part of this text amendment? Um, I mean, I'm thinking of, you know, when a legislature acts or something, they'll sometimes say, like, have a purpose section at the yeah, beginning or something. Yeah, I, like, I, I, I did kind of want that. I don't know. I, that's, that's just something I keep in the forefront of my mind. I don't know. I'm not really sure whether it belongs in the in actually the, in the text. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a justification. It's it's a rationale yeah. for what we're doing. Um, I'm not sure whether it belongs in the text. But well, I think as we get into this parking section that we'll get into at mid month, you'll start these things will start r rising to the surface, and we will address them because uh, we'll show you what the code says about each issue mm -hmm. today and whether or not they're working or not, whether it needs revisions. Okay, but yeah, I clearly but agree. We that's precisely, I think, Eric, what we're, we're trying to what do is do. take on those issues. It's a comprehensive look at Article 9, um, and it's, I wish we were further along on it because there are people waiting on it, but um, I, I think also with, once this is, is done, we want to go to the, to the uh, designer community, the, the consultants, and kind of get their input on stuff. That they, they're really good about issue spotting and looking at unintended and intended consequences for us. So. I think there's got to be room for that as well before we before we ask you to actually vote on it. Any other? Yeah, just a quick yep. question. The, the, the parking regulation is one space per bedroom for everything but duplexes? For everything but detached dwelling, which is two space per unit. Two space per unit. But it's only been that way since 2006. So for only for duplexes built after 2006 would have been required to provide that. Before that it Before was? Before it was two spaces per, per duplex, no matter how many bedrooms they had. And just for purposes of terminology, is a duplex both sides or one side? Oh, yeah, and I meant Each unit. two spaces per unit in a duplex, in a duplex. structure. So four total spaces. Yes. Anything else? I mean, we, we'll put this on a mid-month, hopefully in the first part of the year-ish. Mm -hmm. um, 
we've got a we've got a busy yeah kind of a busy first quarter I think in terms of what we're going to be doing so anything else for the good of the group before we move on I think we have some good direction and issue spotting here and sort of unfortunately this will just just going to be an ongoing process there's a lot of work to do so okay let's move on then we've got three miscellaneous items which I think maybe thank you for staying up with us um, miscellaneous one is a proposed meeting schedule for next year uh, with submittal deadlines Scott or Sheila, I don't know if you want to walk us through anything. It's much um, like what we've seen before, but. The deadlines and the regular meeting schedule is not different from this year. Um, we had had some brief discussion um, a while back about whether a Wednesday night regular meeting, because it would provide a couple extra days to look at the packet but there's the logistical part of it's nice to be able to have that Wednesday as the extra day if we have a really long agenda that we can spill over to two so that was one topic you were going to talk about a little bit with this um, and then on the mid-month schedule, we've got a couple other things to talk about. So do you want me to go over those now or wait? We may as well. Let's go over those okay. now, the, the miscellaneous two uh, um, stuff, because it'll kind of all flow together maybe. The mid-month schedule, um, we've got a couple requests for joint meetings. Um, the Sustainability Advisory Board has requested a joint meeting and they meet on the same day of the month that we have our mid-month but they meet in the evening and so I offered do you want to meet at our meeting or would you like me to ask whether the Commission might be willing to forgo that 7:30 a.m. meeting some month and come for an evening meeting and they were all for the second alternative um, so we had talked about um, that one option would be that you would either in January or perhaps March um, instead of the morning meeting schedule your mid-month to be that joint meeting in the evening with sustainability advisory board and in February you have as part of the OREA design guidelines that subcommittee is a joint committee of HRC and PC and um, we have a request that we have a joint meeting and the HRC would like Planning Commission to come to their meeting in February they meet on the third Thursday of the month which would be the Thursday before your regular meeting week and so we had some conversation with Patrick and Clay and we were thinking it might make sense to cancel your mid-month in February and just count that meeting with HRC as in place of so that you weren't having an additional meeting in February um, if that was agreeable um, and on a happy note happy holidays we were going to cancel the December 2nd mid-month meeting um, because we didn't have a specific topic to talk about so I say we put it back on the schedule and talk about park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just to, kidding just kidding to complete the um, Oria discussion though in March then they would come to you to at your regular meeting um, for the official hearing OREA design guidelines are essentially a rezoning effort so there has to be a public hearing at the Planning Commission and so we wanted to introduce it our plan is to post the guidelines in December once we're done finalizing the 
the subcommittee's <laughs> final um, revisions. Posted for public consumption in December. Hold uh, a neighborhood meeting in January. Hold a joint HRC-PC meeting in February and the formal hearing in March. So that just kind of completes that process. You send us an email. Yeah, we can outline all this. Yeah, you, you all need to see all these dates to, to yes. see what, what's out there. But, um, and I think what we might do is maybe even like a doodle poll or something for the advisory board to Bruce. see which month is good for the most, for the majority of commissioners and just kind of go with that one, knowing that we might not get everybody on board. Um, so, yeah. And the idea b behind us going to the HRC's meeting in February is that that's kind of a, I mean, no actions being taken, but it's just a study session and it's getting into you. their process too, so that mm -hmm. their kind of stakeholders and yeah. folks are. S some of you may recall we did a downtown study where we switched a couple of different nights, I think, with them, and they they appreciated that and. Yeah. It's our turn to go to them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And then they get to come to us the next next month. Do we not have a December meeting? You do have a December meeting. It's not on the attendance sheet. It stops in November. Just on our deten on our. Yeah, that's a special. We just. I'm the only one that doesn't special <laughs> special one. For okay, you. thank yeah. you. Well, someone's got to make the motion. Building it as the months go. Correct. The, the attendance that, sheet. Yeah. The thing that looks like Christmas lights because yeah. it's red and green. She builds it as the months go. <laughs> so. so you're saying we need a motion to accept the 2016 calendar? Mr. Chair. Um, oh, oh, one, one, oh, quick, oh. one quick issue. <laughs> Hold because on. The, the discussion around whether to, and you can, you can accept the calendar and give us some direction, but you know, to, right now we try to populate Monday first and this commission says, yeah, that mm -hmm. sounds fine. The discussion was that that communication deadline of 10 a.m. Sometimes we don't get it posted till 2 p.m. Sometimes you guys don't see it till you start up these computers. Sometimes you want that extra day or two to absorb that information. So we had some recent talk about, well, if we just, you know, mainly made our meetings on Wednesday of that week instead of Monday, that would give us the extra time to look at all the different communications. So we're indifferent. We look to you for guidance on that. If we do have a two week or a two night meeting, we'll just have to suck it up and do both nights and know that that was. Or go Monday and Wednesday because you'll know in advance. Yeah. Right. That's what he's saying. Right. Is that what you're saying? Right. Right. So, oh, we, I'm sorry. We, yeah, <laughs> we, so we'll be able to, yeah, we, we set the agenda for, for mm -hmm. both nights or right. 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 And you would have to, if we, if we did that, it would be good to put both nights on your calendars all year long um, so that you know you've got that as a placeholder because and then when Denny does the legal notice to the papers she sends you that email with the preview so that would be your first notice which is three weeks out from the meeting that you're going to have either one or two nights so I guess what we're asking is starting in January. Cause Do you want to be on? Set. Do you want to go to Wednesday primarily, or stick with Monday's routine? Yeah. I, I have a clinic on Wednesday nights because we never had meetings, and yeah. they said, "When will you take care of patients?" And I said, "If I have to, I'll do it Wednesday night." So it would take months to get out of that. So. And you only have months left. I, I'm done in May. So, um, I I like the idea in general of switching to Wednesday, but it's kind of hard when it's when we've settled into a Monday, and I think you know I imagine staff kind of you know you guys expect it that it's going to be Monday and everything. So, um, if we were starting fresh, I think I'd want to do Wednesday. Now that we're, you know, I know this came about when Jeez. usually you were doing two meetings a month. So June would be a good time to switch. Yeah, maybe we should do that. <laughs> and I suppose that's an, I mean, yeah. we could do that. But, um, so maybe that's that's what we should discuss, because I don't want to do anything that's going to preclude any one of us from making 
those meetings with any Unless regularity. It's <laughs> Unless it's Bruce, says, <laughs> says. We can preclude him. What's your Ooh. name? Oh, we haven't been having two meetings because it's been kind of slow in the planning world, I guess. Well, six years I've For, for many years, it, there was yeah, right. two meetings. That's what I mean, so. In six well, and years, I've that had up. about three Wednesday meetings. Yeah, but the, the option is still there. I mean, what, what this would be doing is basically saying, we'll schedule Wednesdays first, and if, there's, if we need to have two meetings that month, then we'd also schedule the Monday. We'd back it, we'd just invert the order um, that we prefer those days. So we'd still have that option there. I think, the, I think what we need to think about is, individually, does Wednesdays work okay for everybody? No. I actually prefer Sands. Mondays, and the reason I say that is you're going to be here for a while too. So, yeah, you got five and a half years left. Yeah, right, buddy boy. <laughs> buddy boy. <laughs> you're uh, stuck. We, we, I always tend to hold meetings on Wednesdays. Um, I don't know why. I think it's just midweek. Ha half the week's done. I think Mondays are better because no one holds meetings on Mondays. Yeah, that's just that's the feeling I get. I mean, maybe that's just me, but yeah. Good. I have Tuesday and Thursday meetings, but Wednesdays and Mondays are. Well, all of, this, all of this, though, consideration is because we, it would give us more time to read what you send yeah. to us on Mondays. Mm -hmm. But it's been my experience that on Mondays, what you send is generally stuff that's pretty cut and dried it's a communication it's usually just yeah okay yeah, I mean, the one we got today that's pretty cut and dry but it also but just give you time to read the packet just, yeah so, I mean, especially if you, if you have you know family plans mm -hmm. for the weekend or something that is the hard thing is is having a when we have an extra long packet you know 400 pages or something you can't read it all two weeks in advance or spread it out over two weeks you've got to kind of do it in the, the couple days leading up and it it does eat into the weekend there um, does anybody else see any other reasons we ought to move to Wednesday? Because with two members right now saying that it would not really work, I'm inclined to say that we ought not do it. Um, I would like and if to we can always revisit it later. I'd like to revisit it maybe in June mm -hmm. when we've had some more time. Because, I mean, we sort of set schedules. I'm thinking about changing your schedules, like in Bruce's cases, you know, in the next two months. It's challenging, but I, I want to keep thinking about why we brought this up to begin with, which was we thought we may be able to do our jobs better given the extra time. Um, and what's and interesting is I, the only time I could read it is on the weekend. I mean, once the week... You'd have to do it before Monday anyway. Once the weekday anyway. hits, it's like there's no way I can stop on a weekday and read the packet. The, the we, other advantage is it would give the community right. more time to write their letters. Well, the deadline is still well, the same for the no, community. Well, yeah, they, they should be thinking about this stuff where they, they, right, they, right. that, they know that they can write their letter two weeks in advance, a month in advance. Yeah, but if we it's delay their weeks. acceptance of their letters till Wednesday at 10 o'clock, we've got the same problem. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. Let's, yep. it's, let's, it's, let's not mess it with reminds me of broken. pushing your watch forward yeah. so yeah. that you yeah. think you'll be on time for everything. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, if, you, if I put my watch at 11.15 right now, I'd still know it was 11, which means we're sitting here in a meeting that should have ended technically. Right. And we oh, didn't yeah. extend it, so I'll see you all later. <laughs> you want to make a motion? Where yeah. was your motion? Yeah, no, yeah, he's looking at you. Okay, I, you have to make a I retroactive. To, I moved to end the meeting at 11. <laughs> the motion uh, fails no, no. for lack of a second. <laughs> I, I moved to end the meeting at 11.10. I, I think I can second that motion pretty easily. So it's um, a very good vote. Let, yeah, let's, let's keep in mind and potential move. changes if we want down the road, but I think right now we leave it the way that it is. I move to adopt the calendar. We have a motion and a second. Commissioner Denny, any discussion on the calendar? Seeing none, all those in favor, raise your hand. Unanimously approved. Who made Excellent that motion? motion. Bruce. <laughs> Seconded by Commissioner Denny. I move that we change Penny's name to Bonnie. To Bonnie, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I missed my name tag. That was done by, yeah. Okay, Mr. Chairman, Fiat. is that the last motion of the evening? No, I don't oh, think okay. so. Um, 
Miscellaneous two was ah. just a, oh, an FYI, and they'll they'll take care of it. We also have a miscellaneous three, which is receipt of the retail market report. I would recommend that we schedule one of our early mid months to review this with you all. <laughs> it just came. Did you just send it? To and so really, I think it was in the yeah. on the front. I can leave it. <laughs> Leave it there. It's a, I, I think, oh, an interesting right. read. It's one of the, yeah. it's one of the reports I look oh, forward that. to, okay. and we read it. So, please look at it, and it. we'll come with your questions. Okay. We need to find you more exciting reading material, Scott. Great. <laughs> yeah, right. It's very get exciting. Any more exciting than pull factors. <laughs> Uh, so we just received that, no motion to receive or anything like that? No, this was posted to the City Commission's agenda for this week. We wanted, to, we wanted the Planning Commission to receive it. And uh, we, as you know, we use this data and analysis of projects that trigger a certain amount of retail. Excellent. Okay. Anything else? No motion to... We don't need a motion to approve to adjourn because we've completed our agenda, Commissioner Lease. I know you're disappointed. <laughs> no, uh, I would like to submit it for MVP. But yes, you will. You'll be in the running for MB, MVP M, MVP C C MVP C C Most Valuable Planning yeah, Commission yeah. Commissioner. It's going to uh, be like I'm going to have like Phantom Limb on Monday night. You're going to be. <laughs> it's going to be like this. It's going to be like something. You're going to be a, moving. I'm going to stand there and push my face up against the glass. Oh, goodness gracious. <laughs> now you blow in the glass and your lips get really. That'll your be a fun. Gigantic. I'm going to want to do that. I, we'll all look forward to that, Bruce. Uh, if there's nothing else, then we'll be adjourned. Do you, do you realize that you get to know the word? I know. You I hit see. every single. I know. That's, That's why you're MVP. Oh, I,